stressful. I mean, honestly, it's probably both. But the good news, we're gonna get through this together as I walk you through everything from avoiding travel hassles to serving an unforgettable holiday feast. Most importantly, we're gonna help you celebrate the season by maximizing your buying power during these tricky economic times. It's a holiday season like no other as consumers face record inflation, with 70% of shoppers saying they're wary of holiday spending. Nearly 33% of shoppers plan to buy fewer gifts this year, while roughly one quarter said they would opt for cheaper or more practical gifts, such as gas cards. And when it comes to toys... Per item, you're only looking at maybe a 2 to $5 increase, but when you're looking at your overall toy shopping and buying for multiple kids, that can add up really quickly. This year, the pressure is really on to snag those deals. Retailers are responding by earlying up holiday sales and discounting excess inventory caused by last year's supply chain issues. A lot of items are kind of unexpected, like so much casual clothing. We're seeing furniture, we're seeing TVs. About a quarter of Americans are already shopping for Thanksgiving and the holiday season, and there's a lot of momentum going into this time. And despite a hectic summer for airline passengers, some 4,000 flights have been delayed. More than half of Americans plan to travel over the holiday season, with 30% flying. Americans are preparing to crowd the nation's roads and airports again for another busy holiday season. But the journey may be rocky as travelers face fewer flight options, high fuel costs, and staffing shortages. Prices for holiday travel expected to be the highest we've seen since before the pandemic. Generally speaking, last minute fares go in one direction and it is always up. But consumers are keeping spirits bright, taking advantage of more flexible work to travel during off-peak days and finding ways to stretch their dollars in the hopes of making this the most wonderful time of the year. We'll get to those travel hacks and holiday deals in just a moment, but first let's focus on finances. Staying on budget and not going into debt during the holidays is always a challenge. And this year with inflation, it's probably going to be even easier to overspend. So we have with us money expert Kristen O'Keefe Merrick. She is with O'Keefe Financial Partners. She's going to join us and give us some great tips to stay on budget. Kristen, great to have you. Good to see you. Yeah. So first question, what is your number one piece of advice before we even head out to the stores to help us rein in our spending? Yeah, I like a macro strategy. Yeah. I love a good checklist. Um, I think, and I've already done this, is, you know, sit down, however you make your list, hand, type, whatever it works for you, mm -hmm. and make a full, who you're buying gifts for? Yeah. Are you entertaining? Uh, are you throwing a little party for the kids? Whatever that looks like. Okay. Then you want to be thoughtful about, can you map this out over the next couple of months, right? We don't have right. to spend all the money in December. All at once, right. Right, it's, it's November. We can think about being thoughtful about buying wrapping paper now, ordering your Christmas card now, thinking about buying a few gifts here and there when you're at the store, mm -hmm. and, and really being thoughtful about when the spend is happening so that your January credit card bill doesn't crush you. No, I like that, spreading yeah. it out. And also, you're right, you've got to make a comprehensive list so you know exactly what you're in for and who can fall off the list. Who can fall off. How do you do that without being feeling guilty about it and also maybe signaling to friends yeah. and family, we're going to do Christmas a little differently this year? Exactly. And I think it's tough to do it with your kids, right? Especially if Santa is, is still actively involved in, in gift giving, then I think you have to be really thoughtful about how you manage your expectations mm -hmm. with your children. But, you know... Uncle Bobby can be told, hey, we're doing Christmas a little different. Here is a jar of jam that I made for you because it's from my heart. As, yeah. opposed, to, as opposed to a sweater that I right. had to spend um, $70 on. And I think that's where managing expectations becomes really important. Mm -hmm. Both, you know, your spouses, your parents, your siblings, people who are are going to understand your financial situation and be okay with not getting a big fancy gift. And be direct, have that conversation up front early so that everyone's on the yes. same page. That's great advice. Yes. Talk to us about using cash versus credit cards because we see these interest rates, they're going up and up yes. and up. The Fed has signaled they're going to continue to go up. Where do you stand on shopping just with cash? Yeah, I love shopping with cash. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be like you go to the ATM and take out a thousand dollars. You just use your debit card when you're walking around as opposed to using your credit card. The worry that the worry that you wake up on January 1st in debt from Christmas is a really big bummer. It's mm -hmm. a bummer to start 2023 that way. Right. So if you can be thoughtful about spending, like I said, cash throughout, mm -hmm. um, and if you can avoid credit, do so. For the love of God, do so. It's, right. You know, rates are, APRs on credit cards these days could be up to 25%. That's not 
a small amount of interest. And so that adds up, that compounds. Um, the other thing is you can make payments to your credit cards as you go. Okay. To so help keep that interest down so you're not yeah, paying money. Yeah, throw $100 money. at it yeah. once yeah. a week, and that way when the January bill comes, it's less than you have anticipated. One last quick question. What do consumers need to know about these little micro loans? They're buy now, pay later yes. plans. You see them popping up online. Some are even offered at the point of sale in person. What should we know before we say, yes, I'd like to buy now and pay later? Yeah, I, I think that there's a place for buy now, pay later in our life. Um, I think I would... I recommend if you use it for a big ticket item that you wouldn't normally be able to afford. For instance, if you have to replace a refrigerator mm -hmm. or a washing machine and you don't have that cash up front, you can utilize buy now, pay later because what happens is it sets you on a payment plan. And, and most of the time, these buy now, pay later do not accumulate interest. Yeah. But they do impact your credit report, yep. which is incredibly important to know. Uh, and they also can catch up with you if you're not thoughtful about how you're paying them right. on time and also like what happens if you have three loans going at once what if you have four don't buy boots with buy now pay later got it right so no impulse buys no, no consumer type goods you save it for the big items. yes big items only all right money expert Kristen O'Keefe good, Mer good to see you thank you so much with high inflation, secondhand goods may become a popular option for presents this year, but buyer beware. Criminals are also taking notice and they're trying to take advantage of those bargain hunters. What you need to know so you're not ripped off. For holiday shoppers in a season of high inflation, online marketplaces can be a great place to find bargains. Unfortunately, police say peer-to-peer -peer sites like Facebook Marketplace and OfferUp are also being used by scammers and violent criminals. Nine times out of ten, if you see a deal that's too good to be true, it is. Chicago police are investigating dozens of robberies over the past few months. The suspects using online listings to lure in would-be buyers. The offenders will contact them via cell phone and tell them to go to another location. And when they go to that area, Four multiple offenders will show up, display guns, and take not only the money that they have in their pockets, but sometimes vehicles, watches, you know, wallets, that type of thing. It's a trend law enforcement officials say has been growing nationwide. In Houston, police releasing this video of a robbery earlier this year. They say the suspects posed on Facebook Marketplace as potential car buyers. In Florida and Detroit, similar cases of suspects accused of robbing individuals selling Air Jordans and iPhones. Authorities say criminals are most likely to target high-end items like designer purses, all-terrain vehicles, scooters, Apple iPads, and watches. To stay safe, officials say always use safe exchange locations, including in some cities, inside the lobby of a police station. And the police are okay with that? That's what we want them to do, especially now the holidays are quickly approaching. We don't want anyone to trade their safety for a great deal. Experts say online marketplaces are also targeted by hackers and scam artists who use fake accounts and listings to steal your money. Common red flags include the seller refusing to meet in person or let you see the item before purchase. The seller's profile shows the same item located in different states. The seller asking for gift cards instead of cash. Facebook says it takes the threat of scams seriously and has specialized detection tools and trained enforcement and review teams working to remove bad actors from the platform. OfferUp says it also has a team of investigators who look to remove bad items and users from its site and provides in-app tools for identity verification. Facebook also allows users to set up a meeting plan within the app that can be shared with a group of trusted friends, all to ensure your hunt for deals doesn't put you in danger. And Facebook says you should also be aware of buyers who are pushing you to make that sale quickly or if they try to contact you outside of the app. Always try to meet up during the day in a public location. And another way to protect yourself, experts say use a secure credit card or PayPal option whenever you can. Those offer additional fraud protection. And remember, if someone is offering a price that's far lower than market value, that is a big red flag. Coming up, we'll have the 411 on holiday travel from finding deals to dealing with crowds and cancellations. What you need to know about going home for the holidays. Later, skimp, splurge, or swap. How to pull off that unforgettable feast without going broke. You're watching Consumer Confidential on Today All Day. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening, friends.
from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful so life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jen doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Oh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This year, 113 million travelers are expected to hit the road and the skies for holiday trips. That means busier airports and higher travel costs due to inflation. Here to help us navigate the season ahead is Alicia Prakash. She's the Associate Editorial Director at Travel and Leisure Magazine. Alicia, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. Thank you for having me. Everyone wants to know, what are your top tips to make travel this holiday season as stress-free as possible? Yeah, so these days, new travel regulations and short-staffed airports can really lead to long lines when checking bags or going through airport security. Mm -hmm. So I always say it's best to err on the side of caution and arrive at the airport early. Okay. You know, getting to the airport at least two hours in advance is always a good idea, but that's especially true during the holiday season mm -hmm. to avoid any added stress. Uh, similarly, if you're driving to see loved ones, you know, you'll want to allot extra travel time for traffic. Um, apps like Waze can be incredibly useful tools for gauging traffic conditions, mm -hmm. um, not only before you hit the road, but once you're driving. So definitely recommend downloading that as well. Um, now, if you haven't already booked your flights, mm -hmm. um, I do recommend opting for an early morning flight yeah. as well as a, a direct flight. This will help you avoid any delays with layovers and in the event that your flight does get canceled, there will be hopefully plenty of options for, to you, for you to rebook on throughout the day. A couple of questions. We're all going to be together. So any tips for dealing with crowds specifically? And then what happens if your flight is delayed or it is canceled? Walk me through the process of getting your money back. Sure. So if you are truly looking to escape those crowds this holiday season, it pays to be flexible with your travel date. Okay. So, you know, looking to arrive a day or two earlier um, and returning a day early or late can really help you save money as well as avoid those crowds. Like don't go on the peak days. Exactly. You might also want to opt for a smaller airport that's mm. nearby rather than a main hub. So, you know, for example, fly into Long Beach Airport instead of LAX. Yeah. These smaller airports tend to have less demand, so they offer lower prices and fewer crowds. But mm -hmm. either way, if you're flying, download the MyTSA app, okay. which offers information on airport security wait times. Um, so, you know, you can monitor for the hubs that you'll be flying and then uh, plan accordingly. And what do people need to know when their flight is delayed or canceled? Yeah, great question. So, you know, hopefully all runs smoothly. Um, however, first and foremost, you'll want to consider uh, third-party sites like mm -hmm. FlightAware to monitor your flight for any potential delays or cancellations. Um, you know, in the event that your flight is unfortunately canceled, uh, your airline will likely rebook you on a new flight. Um, if for some reason that route doesn't work for your travel schedule, though, call your airline. You know, talking to a customer service agent really provides you with flexibility to get the rebooking that you want. And one tip I really love is call your airline's international hotline. Yes, you know, most I heard about US, this. Yeah, so most U.S. passengers will call the main the U.S. The domestic line, yeah. Yep. And while that's a great option, you'll likely endure longer waits. Mm -hmm. So try calling your foreign office and, you know, the agents there, you'll likely get through faster and the agents there will be able to help you just the same. Right. They speak English. Yep. What's, let's talk about gear. What are the best pieces of luggage or bags? What do you like to travel with? 
Yeah, so, well, first and foremost, I'll say I am team carry-on. So yeah. if you can, pack a carry-on only light. to reduce your chances of losing any luggage along the way. Um, you know, it's also a great idea so that you can bypass the baggage carousel on your way out so you can breeze yeah. right through the airport when you land. Um, but if you are checking a bag, take a picture of your suitcase. Mm. Um, this can really help you get compensated in the event that your bag does get lost or, you know, it does arrive at your destination but arrives damaged. I have uh, about 30 seconds. What's your best tip for booking hotels? Yeah, so I would say um, if you haven't yet booked your hotels, compare prices on sites like Booking.com and Expedia to find a price that's right for you and your budget. Um, interestingly, the platform you use can also make a difference. So, um, you know, if you're on mobile, whether you're in app or browser, hmm. the prices might appear lower there than they would when you're on desktop. Interesting. And yeah, and that's because some aggregator sites will offer app-only promotions mm -hmm. in order to to um, entice their users to download and use their app. So ah. definitely consider that as All well. Right. Alicia Prakash with Travel and Leisure. Thank you so much, Alicia. Yep, thank you for having me. And when we come back, Cyber Monday, Black Friday, those are bargain hunting days, but are you really getting a deal? And skimp, splurge, or swap? Where to go big at the grocery aisle for your holiday feast? Consumer Confidential is coming right back. You get one beautiful so life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. I love you too. <laughs> Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. If you have started your holiday shopping, chances are you have already seen signs for deep discounts. But should you snap up those deals right away? Kevin Bressler is the executive editor at Consumers Checkbook. It's a nonprofit with the mission to help consumers get the best service and lowest prices. Kevin, that's music to our ears, especially right now. Yeah. Welcome. Oh. So let's talk about this study that y'all did. It's not even Thanksgiving, but we have been seeing since October that many stores have been comparing yeah. their deals to Black Friday sales, saying shop early, shop often, you're going to get great discounts. Right. What did you actually find when you compared prices across a yeah. whole bunch of stores. Yeah, actually, when I woke up this morning, there were two junk emails waiting for me <laughs> saying Black Friday starts now mm -hmm. uh, at a few major retailers. Uh, I really urge folks to not worry so much about the timing of these things. Don't think, oh, I'd better jump on this quote unquote deal now or it's going to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been tracking prices at major retailers for years. Uh, we recently completed a study where we looked at uh, 25 major retailers over 33 weeks. We checked in on their prices once wow. a week and found that almost all of them these days are guilty of holding what we call misleading sales, mm. where you know the sales, these supposed discounts never end, uh, right. that week after week when we checked in, these prices, these products were, were listed as being on sale 
but what they're doing is essentially they're crossing out a price, a list or regular price that they rarely, if ever, charge wow. so that they can tell you that they're selling it for 20% off, 40% off, 60% off. So it's like a perma sale. It's, it's just it, always happening. Yes, and you think, mm, okay, I'm getting a better deal. But in some cases, it's never was at that regular price. Right. And, and in many cases, these stores never charged that list price or wow. at least, you know, only charged it for 10 minutes or for a few hours or something. Uh, I think that you know, these are misleading sales. We yeah. call them fake sales. Sure. It's an attempt to get you to not shop around, to right. make you think, oh, you gotta oh, do it's, it now, act yeah. now, buy now. And by you know, if it's six, if it says it's sixty percent off, what's your your inclination is to say, well, they're practically giving it away. Right. Why would I bother shopping? There around? is a real psychology to it. So, okay, you found this. You looked at twenty five stores, thirty three weeks. What is the best way then? to know if a sale really is a sale and if this yeah. really is the good time to buy that item. Right. Don't be pressured. Okay. Don't think, okay, if I don't do this right now, this deal's going to go away because that's rarely the case. We rarely found that, you know, prices dip below a certain threshold for very long and that you really, if you, had, if you hadn't jumped on something, you would have lost out. Okay. Uh, you know, stores, some of them even on their websites have countdown clocks now. That's right. to get you to, to, to ramp up the anxiety to make sure that, you know, that you buy then and there without shopping around. So the key is to shop around. Okay, Just, so compare you know, prices, simply shop make, around. Make sure you can't get a better price somewhere else. Do a, do a quick internet search mm -hmm. uh, to see if, if other major retailers are offering it for less. Sometimes I'll just search it right there in the store. There you go. And if you're in the store, you can even use apps that let you scan barcodes and they'll do oh. comparison shopping for you. Uh, there are price shopping bots out there. There's uh, a few that, that we've tried that seem to work okay. Our mm -hmm. price grabber has one. Yahoo Shopping has one. Uh, there are, you know, extensions you can add to your web browser that will like called honey mm -hmm. it will look around to see if there are coupon codes that can apply or maybe better deals other places i'll tell you none of these things are perfect right, right? none of them work great uh, but overall, the key is to just make sure you do some shopping around before you buy, especially if it's a big ticket item. Kevin, what are you finding in terms of stores and their willingness to do two important things? One, price match. Are stores generally willing to price match if you find a better price and can show it to them? And two, are they willing to do price adjustments more now than they have in the past? Yeah, both those things, yes. Okay, uh, especially if you're in a store and you find that a, a competitor is, is charging less money for that item, mm -hmm. uh, most stores will price match. And it sounds like a pain, but we found, our researchers have found that when they've tried to do it, it's quite easy. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody at the, the register can do it. Sometimes you have to go to customer service. But we found it was a pretty simple, straightforward process. Another thing you can do is, and this is even also kind of a pain, is that after you've bought something, if prices go down, mm -hmm. and so you could have bought it for less at that retailer, you can usually go back and they'll go ahead and make an adjustment to your, your bill. You'll and get being a, a nice refund goes a them. long way. Just it does, nice. yeah. Okay. And, you know, in a lot of these stores, they're set up, they're used to it, surprisingly. I mean, yeah. I just didn't think many people did this, but it was oh, quite easy when we, we tried to, to get these adjustments made. Kevin Brassler with Consumers Checkbook. Thank, Thank you so you. much for your time, Kevin. Good to see you. Well, next up, take the pressure off of your holiday meal. Enjoy the feast without the fuss. We're going to show you how to save time and money when Consumer Confidential comes right back. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now.
Well, it sure can feel like you have a lot on your plate when it comes to planning that holiday meal, especially this year with food prices going up. Have no fear. You can have that feast without the fuss. With me now to help walk us through it all is Real Simple Editor-in-Chief Lauren Iannotti. Lauren, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us on Consumer Confidential. So let's talk a little bit about the big holiday coming up. Yeah. where turkey is the star and turkey prices we know are up 73 percent from last year it's expensive so what are your best tips uh, in terms of how you can save on the staples and still have a wonderful meal where can we skimp where should we splurge where should we swap sure okay don't buy the breast don't buy the whole bird buy the legs so oh. we actually our main event this year i know it's a little bit crazy and i remember talking to my food director and she's like this is not legs legs they're much cheaper because they're less in demand. Mm -hmm. They're totally delicious. It's yeah, dark they are. meat. Dark meat. Yeah, and absolutely. And we have a great recipe for them, and they can be just as delicious as anything else. So I just say that's where you're going to save right there. If you go for the legs, and also they're also like a pound each or a pound and a half, okay. which basically takes the, some of the hard math Matt, out of right. figuring you're it like out. How many people one each per, of you yep, gets a leg? One leg per person. Oh, absolutely. I love that. Okay. Stuffing. Um, don't worry about using dried spices. You absolutely can use dried spices. You can use the spices that are in your cupboard right now. Just anything. I know a lot of recipes call for fresh, fresh right? right. And you feel like, oh, I got to do I that. No, nope. um, you can no, use dried. Okay. One tablespoon of fresh equals one teaspoon of dried. Got it. Okay. Um, I, I was very yeah. careful not to mix it up. I don't <laughs> right. want people poisoning their relatives. Um, <laughs> Too so, much rosemary. <laughs> exactly. So, and um, if you want to get fresh, absolutely. Don't worry about wasting because there are ways to preserve them and save them. You basically cut them like fresh cut flowers, mm -hmm. the, the leftovers, and put them in a um, glass on the counter, and they can stay for a couple of days. Just change the water every day. And then, you know, if you're worried about still not using them, just chop them up and put them in an ice cube tray with olive oil. I love this trip. trick. Put it in the freezer. And then you've got these little flavor bombs you can put in soups Ooh. and stews and sauces. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yep. that's a great tip. What about beverages? Those tend to add up. They get pricey. Yep. What are your tips on saving there? So um, don't feel like you have to have a varietal of wine for every single person. Like Uncle Doug really likes that Cote de Rhone. Well, then he can bring it. <laughs> oh, okay. Your job is to get one red and one white. Crowd pleasers. They don't have to be expensive. If you talk to your, uh, the, your wine shop, they'll mm -hmm. have good bottles for like... 12 bucks a bottle, and the nice. more you buy, the cheaper it is. So if you get a case, if you have a big crowd coming, right. one red, okay. a medium-bodied red that goes okay. nicely with your turkey, yeah. one white, let's say a Sancerre, at least acidic Sancerre, a Sauvignon Blanc that goes nicely with your turkey, mm. and they get to choose, and you're done. I like that. You know, people did that for weddings, too, because if you have an open exactly. bar, it can be really crazy, but if you just choose a few select drinks, nobody really even feels like they're missing out. Totally. Let's exactly. talk about the grocery store. Where can we cut costs? What should we be keeping an eye out when it comes to bargains? So the big thing about saving at the grocery store, and we know it's 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 tough out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the prices are skyrocketing. Um, so plan early. Plan. I like to say shop early, shop often. Yeah. First, set your menu. List up what you're not, what you're going to have to buy. Perishables versus non-perishables. Non-perishables you're going to hold off on. Right now, we're talking about. We've got a couple weeks till Thanksgiving. We're talking about looking out for sales. Mm -hmm. If you have time, you can comparison shop. You right? can. So you look for things on sale. Sign up for your store's um, grocery uh, uh, points uh, card or points. Yeah, the loyalty the program. Loyal, yeah. yeah, and the rewards. Get get. The, you know, if you I don't know what you've been waiting for, but if you haven't done it yet, yeah, do it do now. It now. <laughs> You'll get deals. Um, they'll let you know about deals that others don't get. And then there are also apps that you can sign up mm -hmm. for, or you can, sorry, load up on your phone. And it's Basket. And the other one that we really like is Flip with Flip, two yeah. Peas. Yep. Flip with two Peas. And, you, and, you can, and they will do the comparison shopping for you. They're like you're, you're going through your circulars for you, basically, and telling you where the best deals are and how to get to them. I got 20 seconds. What about cooking? Best tip there. Oh, my God. Um, I guess make ahead. I mean, yeah. so, like, I map it out and I write it down. Here, actually, my best tip is write it down because write that down. way you don't have to keep deciding over and over again. You know what you're making on Wednesday. You know what mm -hmm. you're making on Thursday. You have to spread it all out. You have to make sure you're preparing and making things ahead, and you will have the best Thanksgiving ever. I love it. Great tips. Lauren Iannotti with Real Simple. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. That is going to be our time for now. Catch me on NBC News Now weekdays from 12 to 2 Eastern. For all of us here at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. A big hello to all of you out there watching. I'm Keir Simmons here in London with a very special edition of Pop Start Plus. We're talking about one thing today, the premiere of The Crown, the highly anticipated season five. 
debuts today, and I'm so excited to bring you a half hour filled with everything you need to know about the popular series. We'll have some of my favourite interviews, plus we'll dive into some crown nostalgia as we revisit the previous seasons. But first up, my visit with the newest cast. Imelda Staunton plays Queen Elizabeth, Jonathan Price is Prince Philip, Dominic West is Prince Charles, Elizabeth Debicki plays a breathtaking Diana, and Leslie Manville is in the role of Princess Margaret. Take a look. Her Majesty the Queen! A window into the private lives of the world's most public family, opening once again this morning. You remain loyal to this family. You're in silent. As the fifth and penultimate season of The Crown premiered in London overnight. What the hell is she doing? The royal cast hit the red carpet. We got to meet them. Your Royal Highnesses. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Dominic West plays Prince Charles. Oh, please, just keep going. I, I, oh, no, I can't. Barely needs any introduction. This is good. <laughs> yes. I wouldn't mind, but he doesn't do that in the film. No. <laughs> in light of the events of the last 12 months, perhaps I have more to reflect on than most. Season five portrays a rocky time for the royals. The 1990s, spotlighting the breakdown of Charles and Diana's marriage. How did it come to this? In the Prince and Princess of Wales are separating. 1992, Her Majesty herself describing it all in Latin as a horrible year. It has turned out to be an annus horribilis. Playing some of the most famous people in the world is high pressure, no more so than for Elizabeth Debicki, who is portraying Princess Diana. Do you stand in front of the mirror and, and kind of try and get the uh, mannerisms right, or is that not the right way to go about it? Oh, I think that would be the worst way to go about it. You know, we feel a lot of responsibility with what we do as characters, as actors in the show, but we also know that we're not trying to get a likeness. We're trying to capture a sort of an essence, I think. This is how The Crown depicts the moment Charles and Diana told the Queen it's over. This is really what you want. I heard you all saying that you haven't actually seen a lot of the episodes. We haven't seen the whole series. I've seen a few. So I, so I have... Uh, How does it end? <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Price plays Prince Philip as he berates his son Charles. They're saying we've pressed the self-destruct button. The Queen, Imelda Staunton, looking on in silence. Oh, it's so good. Is that the first time you've seen that? Yeah, I've yeah. seen that yeah. before. These are tumultuous times within the family, and that's very, you know, it's riches for us to play. Um, these are the difficult years. These have been difficult months for Netflix, openly criticised for blurring lines between fact and fiction, including by people close to King Charles and Queen Camilla, like acclaimed British actress Dame Judi Dench. I think that... The public are well aware that it's a drama, it's not a documentary. Some of the criticism has come from people who are friends of Charles and Camilla. Yeah, but they also, those, those particular criticisms came from not having seen a second of, uh, of film yeah. of this series. So why, is it, why do you think they're speaking out like that when they have well, seen Well, because, it? I mean, they, the assumption is that they, their friend, the Prince Charles, would be damaged in some way. But all we're presenting in the crown is what happened. Um, and it's obviously happened. I mean, you know, it's all been hypersensitive since the Queen's death. Of course it has. And, and you know, everyone's been affected, including us. And when the Queen died, uh, we were filming. That's why I think people are hypersensitive at the moment. I think if this was coming out, if this had come out two years ago, I don't think there would be all, all of these comments. You're at a gala, a royal gala, and there you come face to face with the king or maybe the queen as well what do you say first well, i think the rule is they speak to first anyway yeah. no, they speak first. that's right makes it, it easier. Bow. Makes it easier. just bow 
Season 5 reimagines intimate and scandalous details from the adulterous affair between Prince Charles and Camilla. But there are certain things that, that are unavoidable, that are such big events that they are, uh, and they're so big in people's imagination and memory that, that not to tackle them would be, uh, would people, I think, would, would feel cheated. With our son and... Leslie Manville plays the Queen's sister, Margaret. I denied you as Queen, not as your sister. The conditions are irrelevant. The prohibition is... Still tormented by her royal gilded cage. You get the privilege, really, of seeing them as human beings, which is really the gift of the crown and the gift of the scripts. You know, mm. we can say, look at this person. They may be this enormously famous public image, but we can absolutely hone in on them now, and this is what they might have been feeling. For the most recent royal events, we'll all have to wait until season six. This same cast is filming that finale now. It really was a pleasure to talk to them. And coming up, we'll have even more with this exciting new cast. Stick with us. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. I love you too. <laughs> You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah, I love you too. <laughs> We're back here on our very special crown-themed episode of Popstar Plus with more from the season five cast. They spoke to us recently about what viewers can expect. Viewers of The Crown can expect in season five, it's the 1990s and the monarchy was going through a difficult time. Various members of the royal family were finding it difficult. They're all a bit older, inevitably, and yet they're coming up against it in terms of the, the way they're, they're affected by some of their private lives and personal decisions. You, as future king, have a duty. People will never understand how it's really been for me. I never stood a chance. Well, I think the season five, uh, what people will take from the so-called behind the scenes is that these are all events that happened in the early 90s that the, the world knows about and certainly British society knows about. And part of the fascination of the crown is that they do go behind the closed doors and provide some kind of understanding of the royals and how they dealt with these issues, either practically or emotionally. And that's the only reason the crown exists, is to show you behind the doors. I think empathy is very much in this series and has been from the very first season that they did. That's the point of a drama. If you're showing characters, whether they're real or not, surely you're inviting the audience to look at it with kind eyes, or at least try to understand the dilemmas of these characters. And I think Peter Morgan's writing allows that to happen. For years I've called for a monarchy that reflects the world outside. I don't think it's my behavior that's threatening its survival. 
What is love, or how does love exist in a, in a system like the royal family? I think uh, love is in any family and should be in every family. And I think that when you think of the royal family, it's kind of, sometimes you can sort of think they're somehow different and separate and almost like a different breed of person. But they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're human beings with with hearts and feelings and broken hearts and regrets and pain and grief. They are exactly the same as you and I. But of course, it's, very, it's sometimes you have to remind yourself of that. And that's what the, the Crown scripts can do. They can take us into the, the thoughts and feelings of them and show them as people separate from being royals. There's a lovely scene later on in it when Princess Margaret and Queen Elizabeth have a kind of a bit of a showdown together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is, that is not a scene about a monarch and a princess. It's a scene about two sisters. What counts? A prohibition, incidentally. You are not now extending to Anne. That is different. How is it different? And that's what's crucial about it. And that that affords you to go dramatically to a lot of very interesting places. As far as the Queen is concerned, and for Prince Philip, when they met, although an arranged marriage it may well have been, they were very much in love, and I think that was very lucky. But they both knew the responsibilities that they had going forward in their lives as the Queen and Prince Philip. So to have love as a, as, as a very good baseline, I think, helped them enormously. And I think it's the only way they could have existed for so long, to, to actually be in love, rather than just be tolerating each other for 70 years. You make a better person of me. And you of me. Isn't that the point of marriage? You know, through these, these difficult times which we're seeing in season five, uh, for many people, all our lives have difficult periods. These are highlighted because in, in England, you know, the Queen and, and Prince Philip and the royal family have been in our lives, our, our whole lives. And you just take them for granted and uh, you think, oh yeah, yeah, they're doing this, they're doing that. And of course you don't really look at them seriously or consider what they're going through, or what their lives are, not really. And Peter Morgan's trying to just give a little glimpse into what it might have been like to be faced with tragedy, with divorces, with various situations. That's what's very exciting and about this particular season. Great to hear from all of them. And we're just getting started here. Coming up, some terrific crown memories from our Today Vault. Don't go anywhere. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, Download the NBC News app. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Uh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. You'll get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Um, yeah, I love you too.
Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to our special crown edition of Popstar Plus. Each season of the series showcases the monarchy at a different moment in time. I was lucky enough to visit the set back in season two, going behind the scenes of the show at the time. And that's where we met Claire Foy and the rest of the cast. Take a look. It was the wedding that pulled Britain out of its wartime blues. Recreated in the Netflix hit series, The Crown, Queen Elizabeth and her handsome Prince Philip. For better, for worse. And there's more for Crown fans in season two. What is it that you'd have me change? Everything. Filmed in this stately home in the British countryside. Wow. Look at this. We caught up with the cast, who were shooting the royal couple's 10th wedding anniversary dinner. Just hanging out at a banquet with the Queen. A family affair with a conspicuous late arrival by the Queen's rebellious younger sister, Margaret. A woman for the modern age, free to live. She was a Princess Diana before Princess Diana. Yeah, in many was. ways, the same kinds of struggles. Yeah. She yeah. is royal, but doesn't get to be the boss. Yeah, but she hates. Because <laughs> she's naturally, you know. She's naturally the boss. She's naturally the boss. She's a boss. Britain has changed beyond recognition. Setting the tone for the next decade of the Queen's life. Yet the monarchy continues its pre-war routines as though nothing has happened. When the empire crumbles. When her sister Margaret gets into the spirit of the 60s. And her marriage comes under serious strain. And that we find ourselves in it. Prison. The story of the second season is partly the story of her working her way through difficulty into a happier time again with her marriage. There is no possibility of my forgiving you. On set, Claire Foy and Matt Smith are the best of friends. <laughs> They'll be replaced in season three as the characters they are portraying age. But for now, Your Majesty, Hello. Your Royal Highness, Hello. is that the right way That's to exactly address right. you? Yeah. Is or that just, correct? Or Phil. <laughs> <laughs> you, you develop little phrases like, oh, and right, to kind of stop conversations. And I see is a good one. I see. Ah. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there she is, the Queen. <laughs> and some unexpected challenges for Matt Smith, who plays Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. You have a special kind of walk that you do that is the Duke of Edinburgh. Yeah. Do you... Well, he, he walks with his hands. Right. Behind his back. It's like Danny from Greece. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just love that he sort of lives by his own rules, really. A little too much, perhaps. Divorce. It's not an option for us. Philip learns how to make up. Stop it and how to deal with visitors from America. Mrs. Kennedy. No curtsy. No curtsy. Who haven't read the protocol notes. Good evening, your royal majesty. Oh, I feel like that went wrong in about 10,000 different ways. I've seen worse, but I'm not sure when. <laughs> Do you think the royals are watching? We have no idea, but we love to imagine the queen with her slippers with her feet up, you know, with some fish and chips. <laughs> Just going, I don't believe that, Margaret never spoke like that, never did that. Oh yes, she did. I think they need you back on set. Do they? Yeah. Tea? Princess Margaret invites you for tea. Yeah. I mean, how, how good is that? Why not? <laughs> that was so fun to be part of. Next, let's revisit season three. Olivia Coleman, Helena Bonham Carter, and Tobias Menzies spoke to Joe Fryer in 2019 about taking on their royal role. A new cast has been coronated. A great many changes. Queen Elizabeth is now played by Olivia Colman instead of Emmy winner Claire Foy. Tobias Menzies Strong. tackles Prince Philip following in Matt Smith's footsteps. And Princess Margaret is portrayed by Helena Bonham Carter, replacing Vanessa Kirby. Here we have this immensely popular show that everyone seems to love. Up till now. And you guys get parachuted <laughs> in. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Before filming season three, the newcomers met with behind the scenes folks who worked on the first two seasons, including creator Peter Morgan. And he just said, well, you lot used to always be, used to always be so pretty. Uh, <laughs> now we've got to you. We've been employed because we're older and battered. 
on the inside. <laughs> There are no strangers to royalty. This year, Coleman won an Oscar for playing an 18th century queen, Queen Anne, in The Favourite. Now, she's Elizabeth. It's been a harder job to do than Queen Anne, mainly because I am quite emotional and... Uh, no one knows what Queen Anne was like, anyway. Sorry. Exactly. No, you're quite right, that, which is yeah. great. <laughs> the Queen, obviously, everyone is a critic. Everyone knows what she looks like. Everyone's heard her. Everyone has seen her walking. This show is a drama, but she is essentially a no-drama queen. Apparently, she is. but behind closed doors, apparently, she's an absolute hoot. She's a great mimic. She's yeah. a real laugh, isn't she? How much did you study the actual person to try and, like, imitate it, or, or did you want to add your own flair to it? I mean, it's a big part of taking on these roles, is obviously, you know, there's so much footage of them, they're so famous and well-known. You want, obviously, to get close to it, but you also don't want it to be, like, an act of mimicry, because I think that would be kind of irritating to watch for yeah. 10 hours, probably. Should I sigh and moan dramatically? One does like to fit in. You had this unusual situation where there was actors who played these roles before you. Yeah, and got Do awards for them, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you study them at all and how they tackled these roles, or do you say, no, let's cool. move on? Well, I was a huge fan of the show, and so I was sort of trying to go... What would Claire do? Yeah, I definitely <laughs> nicked some ideas from that, yeah, yeah. for sure. Helena Bottom Carter actually played the mother of Princess Margaret in the King's Speech, preparing her to portray the socialite sister. And you then know. I did meet her in real life once, and she did say, you are getting better at acting, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's hilarious because right. it's in her interest that I got better, isn't it? <laughs> The new season covers real-life events that happened between 1964 and 77. A deadly mining tragedy, Princess Margaret's tour of the U.S., including a visit with President Johnson, Prince Philip's appearance on Meet the Press, and we see a young Prince Charles when he first dates Camilla. All of the stories get maybe a bit weightier. It's history that's dramatized. Still, it's a bit awkward when they see real-life royals. You, you met Prince William recently, right? Uh, last year. Yeah. Yes. And he knew you were doing this. Um, yes, yeah, so he, you know, politely going, and what are you doing? Oh, no, no, I know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you watch it? He went, no. <laughs> okay. And while the show was about the crown, both actresses admit their focus is sometimes what's on their feet. Walking in high heels without any kind of, it's quite hard to keep the shoe on, I find, and stockings. Once you know that Helly is not very good with high heels, you've now got to re-watch it all and watch her going. Oh. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Bambi on ice. It's really oh, yeah, well, she's not much better. Yeah. <laughs> I am marginally better. <laughs> yeah. Coming up next, we'll give you a refresher on season four's Diana and Charles. You'll get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. <laughs> the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the press now. Streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to our Royal Pop Star Plus, all about The Crown. In 2020, as season four was about to be released, the third hour caught up with Josh O'Connor, 
who played Prince Charles, and Emma Corrin, who played Princess Diana. I see you're going to bring a deep and lasting joy to the nation. And if I may say, you both look very much in love. Oh, yes, absolutely. Whatever in love means. Oh, it's so good. I wonder what it feels like to have the whole world watching, waiting for your roles to come out. Josh and Emma join us now. Good morning to you or good afternoon uh, to you guys in London. Mm -hmm. First of all, congratulations. I mean, I mean that so sincerely. Everybody I know, everywhere, even literally have family everywhere. in other countries, uh, we're all waiting for this. Um, we want to show our viewers this side-by-side -side photo. It is amazing. Emma, can you see this? Uh, we're going to put this up. Is it true that at <laughs> first you were just brought in as a stand-in to read lines with Josh? I mean, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I was um, asked to come in and help read opposite the girls auditioning for Camilla. Um, and uh, Josh was there as well. So yeah, that's the first time we met. And um, yeah, kind of crazy thinking back. Wow, it was meant to be. And Josh, this is now your second season playing Prince Charles. Is it true you make a scrapbook for each character you play? Uh, what can we find in your Charles scrapbook? Um, it is true. <laughs> uh, my Charles one was slightly trickier because um, normally there seems to be a kind of uh, a world which I feel closer to or understand a bit better. I think it's quite hard. It's quite hard to get your hands on gold <laughs> um, or anything too regal and royal. But uh, I found um, I have little cuttings of material because he was mm. into his suits and suiting. And then, um, yeah, the other thing was uh, I managed to get some sort of uh, some old sports kit, because that feels very English, posh, <laughs> kind of rich kid. Um, so I've got bits of that, but mostly just kind of research and writing and that sort That's of awesome. thing. I love that. Um, you know, so what's interesting about this season, as opposed to earlier ones, is that now so many people have lived through this time period. So uh, we've lived through the history, and now we're watching you guys act it out. I mean, Emma, y you had the opportunity to even ask one of Diana's private secretaries about her, right? So what, what exactly did you learn? Um, yeah, I talked to Patrick Jepson, which was um, amazing. I think whenever, and I've, since I've met a few people who met her or have known her, and every time I do, it is so strange um, because I have no living memory of her. So it's always kind of wow. bittersweet for me to talk mm -hmm. to people who, who were close to her. But I remember him just saying how happy she was. And yeah, mm -hmm. and that made, like how she was had a very natural inclination towards happiness. Um, and if you knew her well, you always could make her laugh in an instance, um, which was so nice. Yeah. yeah, it must be nice to hear some of the stories firsthand. And, and Josh, you know, after two seasons, it's that time in The Crown where it's time to pass the role on to another actor as, as we see happening. So what, what will you miss most about playing Prince Charles? Um, I don't know that I'm gonna miss uh, specifically Charles moments, to be honest. I think the thing that I'll miss the most is uh, the unbelievable crew that work behind the camera and the cast, you know, we've we've created a family here mm -hmm. and we still have a WhatsApp group and we all still kind of stay in touch. But I think just missing out on the kind of ca uh, camaraderie of being on set with this group of people is is going to be hard. As for someone else taking on, I'm, I, I'm so excited to see whoever it is and what they do with it. And I'm sure they'll all do a terrific job. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I was just going to ask you, Emma, apparently you do a pretty good Charles with Josh and Diana needs some work. <laughs> <laughs> is this what you guys did during your breaks on set? We were it's trying true. to learn different words. What did we learn last week? Is. Is. Instead of saying years, they say, no, is. instead of saying yes. yes. Oh, instead of saying yes, you say <laughs> is. I yes. still can't even do it. Is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else you can teach us really quickly? One word. Um, my word for Diana Emma. was always all right. 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 We'll practice that right. while we watch the crowd. <laughs> Dylan, you do it. You're probably better. All right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Wow. So fun to compare the latest cast to those two. That was a great special edition of Popstar Plus. Hope all of you Crown fans out there enjoyed it. Happy binge watching. And thanks for joining me. Have a great day. I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore 
is serious about his crab. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomping vine of crab. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty, and savory, all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can't. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you got to think blue crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices and you just start whacking that bad boy and get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Mm. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region. But here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today, and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People have been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little, and I'm um, 25. <laughs> People from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Good to see Ma you. Ma <laughs> How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. <laughs> Pardon me. I've, I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five pants and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for her autograph, they ask her for her picture, they ask her to hold the babies. You know, it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 years. Yeah, right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back? Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh-huh. There, it's like walking to somebody's home that's, they're, they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel, oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people, we were here 20 years, it's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886. Started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a smorgasbord of, of everything. 
going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone, running in the shipping department. Well, a tray like that is about, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking. And I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you did you think you were going to end up here? You were going to be doing this? No, <laughs> no. But it was hard to get away from, and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see see it ending with my parents. So the pandemic hit. Yes. You really had to step up. My father called me and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's which honest good, truth. <laughs> which could be a good or a bad. That's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm going to say it's been around 33, 34 years. And I started at the end of 79, uh, a week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old, and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities, but you love each other and it always works, you know, it always works well. What's, what's really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Soybean. Soybean, thank you. So excited to have this And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's, it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created a recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's crab cake recipe? Oh man, I know. With her, she won't tell me. <laughs> he doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs. You use it's crushed broken up saltines. Saltine. Broken saltines, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients it's together, right. nothing more. That's right. And the fine. big ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. Yes. Oh boy. Oh. It was just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living pulling in Maryland's most famous catch. 
Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love yeah, I love you too. <laughs> get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love yeah, I love you too. <laughs> this Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well, he grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman, and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There's more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole east coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forged their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise is essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. Yeah. How they biting today? This morning it's been pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do, and got nobody to tell you go get me this or go get me that. Seventy-five-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning. Before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, now bay 15, and I've been at it ever since. Right now, uh, I'm going down the line and 
uh, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. Not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got all the jobs, and it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall, but changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black watermen, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, in, a, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it'll be no chance of more black watermen. I really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught high as 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise. And educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. And it, it, it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next, an up and coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking. our true crime mysteries try dateline premium on apple podcasts you'll get early access to originals plus bonus content and everything is ad free so head to apple podcast now to subscribe for breaking news in our changing world download the nbc news app the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis a daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Back in Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. 
I'm an artist at heart. So uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, what crab platform? Crab is king in Baltimore. So um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in DC. So we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our Warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side. And pretty much I'm just always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food. So learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watched my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you have people standing in line, hundreds of people <laughs> on the block in, the, in that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was, it was just may, it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Natasha, my big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, that are people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know? Coming up, I'm going to grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crab. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are oh, I was you trying got it. to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. Well, I know I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. Were you able to add a little bit? Yeah, but he's always asked me uh, when I fix a dish, well, what did you put in this? How did you do, how did you do this? And I would tell him, I said, you don't have to follow to the letter, you know, put your own spin. And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. Genius! The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, 
egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and microgreens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right, patient's ready. So how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first what you wanna do is say we have some uh, Merlin jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. uh, typically uh, I like to sift through it. Just gotta see if there's any shells, and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So, Glory, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> this sauce particularly is our, our crab sauce mix. So we're going to drizzle a little bit at a time. I don't want to put too much. Right. Just enough to uh, bind. You got enough for Yep, I think I'll have enough. Oh, she's, 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 I like this. I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about you know when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh huh. Gonna start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why? Why? Why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular at the restaurant? The most popular. Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a, a bar more favorite and then, you know, make it handheld and on, on the go, uh -huh. you know, it's throwing your hand. Kind of food. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's, it's very popular, other than the taste as well. Right, well, exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's you can take taste. it with you, but if it's not right, tasty, right, probably, exactly. right. Uh, come back for it. Yeah, so what we're going to um, do is uh, we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh, crab, something like a, a quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. They're gonna sit in the middle. Is that too yeah. much? Yeah, mm -hmm. you wanna take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, you wanna put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so that's perfect right there. That's right, perfect, sorry. perfect. <laughs> and we're gonna Just literally fold them up envelope style. What is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is a uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Hey, yeah. is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. No. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! Done! Faster than what I did. Wow! <laughs> Wow, that natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're gonna get get the deep fryer up here and fry these yeah. bad boys up. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Woo! If you had to describe the heart of your cuisine, what is it and, and how does Baltimore uh, kind of part of that? Pretty much my, my story. And I think that connects very well to our Baltimore, you know, because you know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life. And I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about it. And it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore. And they, they watched my journey through the years. And I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I do. Make sure and so crisp around the edges and then things like that. So that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't fry uh -huh. on one particular side too much. And, Want to even fry? Mm. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally. So, yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made, and this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet, has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah, and that's Probably. the piece. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. Crab cake egg roll. Yeah. Here we go. Wow. Chef Alex, you have done Baltimore Pride. Thank you. <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls, and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true, food tastes better when you eat it with family.
My nail tech knows how to keep it a little secret. At 24, Jack Harlow is a leader in rap's latest generation. His clever lyrics, rhythm-driven flow, and viral moment-making charm Love you. Bye. Love you. <laughs> have found him a massive following on social media. She brought a buddy in. What you studying? And in real life. I think I'm coming in at a time where rap has gotten like very street again. I think I'm blessed to like have a spot right now because it's not a time where like it's like, yeah, let's let as many white boys in as we can. People are looking for authenticity. So how close is this to home? It's not far off. It's, I think people relate to it though. A lot of the fans after the show they talk to me and they're like, my garage looked just like that. Yeah. That meant so much to me. Yeah. Harlow currently is touring the country with his latest album, Come Home, The Kids Miss You. That title is a nod to his desire to get back to his hometown of Louisville, Kentucky after a dizzying rise to fame. I was spending so much time away from Kentucky that uh, something was calling me back and continues to. I recorded most of the album outside of Kentucky. And it also was kind of an inside joke that um, I'd seen my fans commenting it under everything. They would say it on some like distant wife energy. So <laughs> it's something that just felt appropriate for the time. Yeah. It became like, I just like titles that like signify an era. Mm -hmm. So speaking of, of where you are with the title of the album, you have exploded in the last couple of years in popularity and fame and success and all those measurables. How have you kept your head about you? I'd like to think the company I keep maybe. It's a lot of my day ones and team strong. I feel like a lot of people around me have like strong integrity. On a day to day basis, they start to rub off on you. And a lot of my homeboys will still, still tell me exactly what they think or, you know, make fun of me. You know what I mean? It's not some weird hierarchy that makes me feel like I'm in a strange position. What about your family? They keep you grounded too? Yeah, definitely. They make it clear to me all the time that they like care about my happiness before anything. You know, you have a party, or maybe you'll have some people over. You have this moment where you're like, you know, all these people might not be here if I wasn't in the position I was in in life. Maybe they wouldn't be smiling as hard or maybe they wouldn't laugh as hard at every joke I'm making. And then so you start to account for everyone in your life that you feel like would be no matter what. Check this out. I'm from the, and I the son of small business owners, Harlow was raised in a home that was a little bit country, a little bit hip hop, with a mother who listened to Drake, Eminem, and Kanye West. So how early do you remember listening to hip hop with your mom? I always say my um, earliest memories when she went and bought late registration by Ye on disc. Played in the car and she's like, you can't, you can hear this, but you can't say a lot of these words you're about to hear. So I just remember listening to late registration in the car with her. It's definitely a, a key moment for me. She had a huge CD collection that I would sift through on my own, you know, without even being handed anything and just be like, huh, let me listen to this. So definitely had my like dusting off the vinyl moments because of her. But your dad's a country guy, right? Yeah. So you got these two influences. Yeah. Does that side show up in your I music so. at all? I think so. Yeah. I think the storytelling, which is in both genres, but like the vibrato, <laughs> he likes to sing. He sang at their wedding. He sang Suspicious Minds by Elvis. So yeah. he, um, my dad's soulful, you know? So I definitely inherited some of that. And, yeah, I love country. I don't know if I'd, I would make country, but there's like a lot of the emotion and storytelling and just the yearning I love about it. Got the girls like OMG, skaters like totally stand out geek, acting like you didn't notice me. Going by Mr. Harlow, Jack first showed promise with the mic in middle school, where he sold homemade mixtapes for $2 a pop. So your, your parents talk about when you were young, with the Guitar Hero mic, you're in your room writing rhymes, you're 12 yeah. years old. Is that about when you remember catching the bug of I think hip hop's my thing? 
hip hop wasn't like a niche genre by the time I was a teen. Right. It was everything. It was influencing the way we were dressing. Even as white kids, it was just like, it was the it. It was culture, period. So it's what you grow up in. It's like the kids that decided to go make a band are the ones that were doing something niche. So beyond the mixtapes that were very popular, what's the moment where you said, okay, now I know I can do this for a career? Of course there's like affirming moments, but like I can't pinpoint a time where I was like unsure, Hmm. which is strange. But I think day after day, your self image is like, duh. Slowly you shape your reality into exactly what you expect for yourself. And of course there's bumps along the way to discourage you. It's tons of imposter syndrome for me. Really? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a black genre, and I was white, so it's just, I am white. <laughs> so, you know, so many of your peers come from a different background and have different stories, and you sit, you feel like, you have moments where you feel like an outsider. So how did you get over that? How did you make that leap to feeling like you, yes, I should be here with these guys? You know, there's like those moments where you're in your head, and then there's moments where you're out. And I think I was lucky enough to spend more time out of it, not saying, I wonder how they're taking me, and more like, they f*** with me. You know, I'm good. I belong. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. (laughs) The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. What's it like to walk out here, just wall to wall, floor to ceiling, people screaming and giving it all back to you? It's a high. On the right night, it's a complete reminder why I chase this. It's totally euphoric. The ones that hate me the most are just like me. It has been two years of highs for Jack Harlow. Back with the Remus. The hip hop artist who exploded onto the scene in 2020. What's poppin'? Brand new whip just hopped in. With the multi platinum hit, What's Poppin'? My track record so clean, they couldn't wait to just bash me. Then came a feature on the Lil Nas X hit, Industry Baby. Are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> yes, I am. Followed this year by First Class, Harlow's first song to go to number one, with some help from an irresistible sample of Fergie's Glamorous. I'm as proud of First Class as any song. And it's not, it's not because of how big it is either, it's because of what it is. And what is it to you? It's just full circle. Anytime you can work your own personal DNA into your artistry. Hip hop artists have been doing it for years. They sample whatever their parents were playing in the house or they sample something they loved when they were six. But what's beautiful is there's kids right now that think that's the song. And they hear Glamorous and they're like, oh, is that a remix of yeah. First Class? Or, you know what I mean? So it's bringing it to a new generation. Fair to say that is a song that changed your life? Yeah, I would say so. Anytime you can get a song that just translates and touches that everyone knows, children know, you know, older people know, everyone knows, it's like, it does something to your career in that moment. And it's crazy because it's such a commercial record, 
But it's so full circle for me because I was paying homage when I did it, which is one of the pillars of hip hop is just sampling. It was like, we created this from the ground up. Me and my producers, I chose that song that I grew up on. I was like, let's make something of this. So it's rare, I think, that people, sometimes people's biggest commercial moments might not resonate in their heart. Mm. Even though it's success and they're grateful for it, it might not hit their heart like, mm. And I think people would be surprised. I know that first class is like soulful to me at least. You had a lot of influences growing up. I think that wouldn't be the first one most people would pick for you to come out with your big hit song, right? That's right. And that's what you want. You want something that's like, oh. Because I think when it came out, everyone was kind of like, damn, how's nobody done that? Mm. And that's what you want. You want one of those like, oh. You want, you want your peers to be like, oh, why didn't I think of that? So now that you decide that's the sample, what's your writing process? Yeah, well, it was like sort of a theme throughout the album is conversing with the sample so not just letting the sample be in the background or talking over it but rather like playing off of it like even my intro talk of the town we sample destiny's child and i'm talking to the sample so it became a theme throughout the album i think and then for the verses i think we hit the nail on the head with the hook so hard it just was so like there's something obvious about it, like, yeah, this is very easy to attach to. For the verses, I just wanted to rap mm. and say a few things that might even be polarizing, like certain lines that people were like, why would he say that? But it's like, that's the balance. It's curation. Like, anyone had the opportunity to sample Glamorous. Everyone is al allowed to do that. It's like, when you choose to do it and the timing, like, it's up to you. And shorty, like, you know that boy Jack is going places. I know. But his sights are set on more than music with an upcoming acting debut in a remake of the 1992 movie, White Men Can't Jump. You mean play basketball? Stepping into the role made famous by Woody Harrelson. How'd you play? Oh, the cameras will tell you I did well. <laughs> they only use it in the good takes, I'll tell you That's that. That's good. Ah! And while he seemingly is everywhere these days, Harlow still is most at home on stage. Having the garage, the lights, the smoke, the lasers, it's all fire. I would have an empty stage and I'd perform with a white tee and shorts on. If the crowd is perfect, nothing else matters. Last time you were in Boston, you're in a little bar trying to scare up 100 people. Yeah. Right now there are people sleeping on the sidewalk to get in tonight. There's so many levels you can reach, right? But truth be told, like when I look out, I'm like, this is really all you need to sell out a room means the world like so many people don't get a chance to feel this when you look ahead what do you see i think i still have a lot to prove in the music space i think i've had like some amazing commercial success but i think there's still stories and like art i want to make that i haven't made i think i still have to prove myself a little bit which is exciting i think that's how you want to feel and that's how you stay hungry so as my image and brand like continues to grow and people recognize me in the street whether they listen to my music or not. I really want to make sure that um, I leave behind the mark I want to leave on music and, and be a true storyteller and have music I'm really proud of that I can look back on and say, man, this helped someone. Mm. So I still have steps I want to take as just an artist, so I'm hungry. But in terms of trajectory, like, we're gunning for the top. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Um, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Redmayne 
is as charming in person as he is chilling on screen as a real-life serial killer in The Good Nurse. I took this job because I wanted to be close to my kids, and then when I get here, she won't even let me see them. And then she starts making up this insane stuff about poisoning the dog. I'm going to call it creepy, but I mean that as a compliment because the character uh, deserves it. Yeah, I and would has certainly take earned it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it, Mark. Is it because what they're saying is true? Investigators estimate over the course of 16 years, Charles Cullen may have killed as many as 400 of his patients while working in nine hospitals across New Jersey and Pennsylvania. His crimes eventually were uncovered by a fellow nurse, played in the movie by Jessica Chastain. I grew up in New Jersey, yeah. and I remember hearing something about it, but I had no idea the extent to which he was killing people. I knew nothing about it. I was astonished I didn't know about the story. He may be the most prolific serial killer in American history. Was there any part of you that hesitated to take this role because of who he is, or did that make it more of a challenge and more interesting to you? Because the script was unlike anything I'd read, it didn't seem to fit into a genre. On the one hand, it was this hero's journey. On the other hand, it was a kind of character study of these two people. And this film felt like violence being prevented through compassion and empathy uh, and humanity, which I thought was intriguing. Um, so it was that coupled with Jessica Chastain, mm. who I think is just one of the great actors um, of like our generation, all generations. So the idea of getting to play this with her, with a wonderful Danish director called Tobias Lindholm at the helm, it felt like an, an interesting thing. It was fascinating to watch too, because what makes it all the scarier really is that he felt charming in some ways. He felt like he too was empathetic a as a nurse. Mm. What did you find in him as you started to study that, that you wanted to portray in the character? This guy, aged seven, he was abused by one of his sibling's partners and tried to kill this, this man and then tried to kill himself, aged seven. He, age 15, his mother, who he was very close to, died in a car crash. And when he arrived at the hospital, they had lost her body. Um, and he was pretty traumatized by that. He then went into the Navy. And when he was in the Navy, he passed all the psychiatric tests to get into the Navy. And it was only when he was found with his fingers over a Poseidon missile button uh, in a submarine that he was kind of expelled from the, from the Navy. And he then went back to the hospital that his mum had died at to train to be a nurse. But Amy Lochran, the real Amy, um, we were lucky enough to spend time with uh, before making the movie. And the thing that she said is, that was like the most important to her was, this was two different human beings. On Her friend, the man who saved her life, was kind, gentle, sensitive, funny. And then she met the monster twice and this, and it was a different human being. So it felt very important for Jessica and I to really mine the truth of the friendship rather than playing any sort of tropes, I suppose. How did you capture that sort of physical essence of him? The part I love about my job is kind of getting to immerse yourself into a world you knew nothing about. He had this very unique kind of hunch. It was almost like he was being held up by the collar of his, the nape of his neck. But also it's about blankness and about kind of anonymity. This was a man that would sort of disappear into the sidelines. Was it hard to get out of that man once you're inside his head um, as deeply as you were? I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old, <laughs> so, uh, and for the sake of my wife's sanity, <laughs> staying in Charlie Cullen would not have been uh, enjoyable for anyone. Uh, so no, I definitely, the, the interesting thing about the making of this film is Jessica Chastain and her husband and her children, we, we all have kids the same age. Uh, Tobias, our director, is a wonderful family man. And so despite the intensity of the story, definitely it was playdates at weekends. Okay, good. Uh, there was tequila on a Friday. Good. Yeah. I was, imagine uh, you needed the tequila on a Friday. We did need tequila on a Friday. Tequila on a Friday was quite an essential element of the making of this film. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are out. Oh, you trying got to it. do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are out. Oh, you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The 40-year-old red name began to play more sympathetic characters when he was just 10, while attending the Jackie Palmer Stage School in London with some notable classmates. You had some good company at Jackie Palmer. Your friend James Corden. James was there. Aaron Taylor-Johnson was there. Yeah. Cradle was of there. greatness. Well, I mean, we definitely didn't know it at the time. <laughs> I'm not sure. Redmayne grew up one of five children. His father was a banker. His mother ran a relocation business. I don't come from a family who were massive theater fans or film or music fans. I don't know, I had an instinct in me. I loved music and singing and acting at school. And to my parents' credit, which now as a parent myself, I really do hold high is they just, anything I had an interest in and what all my brothers had an interest in, they, they supported. While studying art history at Trinity College at Cambridge, Redmayne performed in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night and caught the eye of a talent agent. You know, I'd always dreamt of doing this as a profession, but I didn't know how feasible that was. They had voice coaches and verse coach. It was kind of my drama school, really. Mm. And I suppose that's where I began to take it and myself seriously. And did your parents ever, despite all the support, whisper to you that this was going to be a tough road, tough. maybe? You oh, should endless, go to medical endless school? Endless whispers. <laughs> endless whispers. They did kind of encourage me to go to university to have a sort of backup plan. Everyone's always like, what would you have done otherwise? And I kind of go, maybe a curator. And I'll, I have no right. idea, but I, right. I think I would be useless. So it's good this worked out otherwise. Thank God. There's no backup Thank God. plan. <laughs> Seriously, there really is no backup plan. But, yeah. Did you find some success on the stage, for mm. sure, in London. And then yeah. you decide it's time to move to Hollywood and yeah. check that out. And you, you, live you make it sound so... Uh, <laughs> just, yeah, okay. Yes. You just I'm off to Hollywood. Skipped off to I'm Hollywood from, from the West yeah. End. You live in a house, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's you, Andrew Garfield, Jamie Dornan, and others? No, that is slightly wrong. The tr truth is that, that Jamie and I live together. Okay. But at a different time, I lived with Andrew. But we were all a group of actors who would find ourselves in Los Angeles, uh, normally in the rainy months in London. <laughs> um, in theory, going to try and get work, but I, don't, I genuinely don't think I ever got any work in Los Angeles. I, um, I, but we would audition relentlessly, and we would be helping each other with our auditions quite often. Auditions which we would then be auditioning for. I was with Andrew last week, and, 
And when I go to LA, it's sort of flooded in nostalgia. I definitely look back on it with rose tinted spectacles. I was like, man, wasn't it wonderful? And he's like, yeah, it was. And I'm like, was it though? You know, actually, actually, it was a lot of um, rejection. And I remember just perpetually driving around Los Angeles with sheets of these sides for auditions, you know, with 12 different American accents, none of which you were probably particularly <laughs> nailing. And, uh, and the thing about Los Angeles, which to this day I struggle with, is like, it's traffic, nightmare, yeah. total nightmare. Yeah. So I would either be an hour early or two hours late, which we can, I can now look back on romantically. But Definitely didn't I think that's true time. of everyone. They look back on their 20s. Wasn't it great? Wasn't it wonderful? No, I was struggling. I couldn't pay my rent. Exactly. In his first major movie, Redmayne found himself acting with Angelina Jolie and Matt Damon, and directed by Robert De Niro in The Good Shepherd. I would like very much to join CIA. What did you learn on that set that maybe helped you down the road? I remember the thing about you know, working on film is, is that cameras see everything. And there's sort of no room for nerves. So I, I think I sort of learned watching that film back that I've got to get rid of that somehow mm. because I'd, I'd sort of rather get fired than, than, than be terrified. Do you um, see those nerves when you go watch yeah. that film? Oh, yeah, you yeah. Do. I see myself, I do. And I, and I have an amazing, I learned so I remember many things, but De Niro would do this thing when when you were shooting, you would do a take, and um, and it, if it was an emotional scene, he would keep you playing the scene, and once you finished the take, rather than call cut, he would ask you to kind of bottle the emotion and go back to the, the top of the scene mm. and start um, all over again, take that emotion and kind of repress it and see where it took you the next time. And that became a technique on... Um, during Les Miserables on empty chairs and empty tables. That was something that I used. Redmayne's breakout came in 2012, when he played a leading role in the film adaptation of the iconic Broadway musical, Les Miserables. My place is here, I fight with you. Two years later, he took on the challenging role of physicist Stephen Hawking in The Theory of Everything, earning praise from Hawking and an Oscar for himself. While well, there is life, there is hope. So you flinch a little bit when I use the term Oscar winner. Why is that? Uh, mm. <laughs> you did Does it again. Does it ever feel real? <laughs> That's the thing. The thing about Oscars is that, that the whole thing is so extraordinary. It's because the second you win an Oscar, you get taken off the stage, thrust into this room with thousands of journalists. Right. The adrenaline is pumping through your body. But it was only much later in the evening. We were in this room overlooking Sunset Boulevard and the sun started to rise over Sunset Boulevard. Oh, and for me, that, that was the moment that, that something that, that felt real. Redmayne was nominated for Best Actor again the very next year for his performance in The Danish Girl, before taking a leap into blockbusters, starring in the Harry Potter spin-off series, Fantastic Beasts. Swivel, but delicately. I'm swiveling like you're swiveling. I don't believe you are. The billion-dollar franchise launched the respected actor into a new kind of stardom. Did that change your... Ability to go outside and all those things. Like in London, I mean, it did shift things because it's you know seen by gazillions of people. But those people that are passionate about that world, uh, there's a great generosity to them. What's odd is sometimes when you go to countries you've never been to before, and so you're having a kind of tourist experience, and then people come up to you and right, then you become the attraction. You're there to yeah, see something. Like, Wait a second, Wait, I'm no, no, the pyramids. <laughs> <Seriously>. Yeah. <laughs> Now one of Hollywood's main attractions, it is clear Redmayne chose the right career. I love what I do. You don't take it for granted because it, it's it's a wonderful, a wonderful existence. And you've proven to your parents that you made the right choice. Just about. Yeah. <laughs> Not quite yet. I think the Oscar probably got Well, them. yeah. I think you've done it, son. <laughs> Eddie, thank you so much for the time. Thank you. Such a pleasure. So nice thank you.
A big hello to all of you out there watching. I'm Keir Simmons here in London with a very special edition of Popstar Plus. We're talking about one thing today, the premiere of The Crown, the highly anticipated season five debuts today. And I'm so excited to bring you a half hour filled with everything you need to know about the popular series. We'll have some of my favorite interviews. Plus we'll dive into some crown nostalgia as we revisit the previous seasons. But first up, my visit with the newest cast. Imelda Staunton plays Queen Elizabeth. Jonathan Price is Prince Philip. Dominic West is Prince Charles. Elizabeth Debicki plays a breathtaking Diana. And Leslie Manville is in the role of Princess Margaret. Take a look. Our Majesty the Queen. A window into the private lives of the world's most public family, opening once again this morning. You remain loyal to this family. You're in silent. As the fifth and penultimate season of The Crown premiered in London overnight. What the hell is she doing? And before the new royal cast hit the red carpet, we got to meet them. Your Royal Highnesses. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Dominic West plays Prince Charles. Oh, please, just keep going. I, I, oh, no, I can't. Barely needs any more. This is good. <laughs> yes. I wouldn't mind, but he doesn't do that in the film. No. <laughs> in light of the events of the last 12 months, perhaps I have more to reflect on than most. Season five portrays a rocky time for the royals, the 1990s, spotlighting the breakdown of Charles and Diana's marriage. How did it come to this? In the Prince and Princess of Wales are separate. 1992, Her Majesty herself describing it all in Latin as a horrible year. It has turned out to be an annus horribilis. Playing some of the most famous people in the world is high pressure, no more so than for Elizabeth Debicki, who is portraying Princess Diana. Do you stand in front of the mirror and, and kind of try and get the uh, mannerisms right, or is that not the right way to go about it? Oh, I think that would be the worst way to go about it. But, you know, we feel a lot of responsibility with what we do as, characters, as actors in the show, but we also know that we're not trying to get a likeness, we're trying to capture a sort of an essence, I think. This is how the crown depicts the moment Charles and Diana told the queen it's over. This is really what you want. I heard you all saying that you haven't actually seen a lot of the episodes. We haven't seen the whole Some of them, seen a few. So I, so I have... Uh, how does it end? <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Price plays Prince Philip as he berates his son Charles. They're saying we've pressed the self-destruct button. The Queen, Imelda Staunton, looking on in silence. Oh, it's so good. Is that the first time you've seen that? Yeah, I've yeah. seen that. Yeah. These are tumultuous times within the family, and that's very, you know, it's riches for us to play. Um, these are the difficult years. These have been difficult months for Netflix, openly criticised for blurring lines between fact and fiction, including by people close to King Charles and Queen Camilla, like acclaimed British actress Dame Judi Dench. I think the, the public are well aware that it's a drama, it's not a documentary. Some of the criticism has come from people who are friends with Charles and Camilla. Yeah, but they also, those, those particular criticisms came from not having seen a second of, uh, of film yeah. of this series. So why, is it, why do you think they're speaking out like that when they have Well, seen because, it? I mean, they, the, the assumption is that they, their friend, the Prince Charles, would be damaged in some way. But all we're presenting in The Crown is what happened. Um, and it's obviously happened. I mean, you know, it's all been hypersensitive since the Queen's death. Of course it has. And, uh, uh, you know, everyone's been affected, including us. Um, when the Queen died, uh, we were filming. That's why I think people are hypersensitive at the moment. I think if this was coming out, if this had come out two years ago, I don't think there would be all, all of these comments. You're at a gala, a royal gala, and there you come face to face with the king, 
or maybe the Queen as well. What do you say first? I think the rule is they speak first anyway. Yeah. No, they speak <laughs> first, that's right. Makes it Just easy. bow. Makes it easier. <laughs> Just bow. Season five reimagines intimate and scandalous details from the adulterous affair between Prince Charles and Camilla. But there are certain things that, that are unavoidable, that are such big events that they are, uh, and they're so big in people's imagination and memory that, that not to tackle them would be, would people, I think, would, would feel cheated. With our son and... Leslie Manville plays the Queen's sister, Margaret. I denied you as Queen, not as your sister. The conditions are irrelevant. The prohibition is... Still tormented by her royal gilded cage. You get the privilege, really, of seeing them as human beings, which is really the gift of the crown and the gift of the scripts. You know, mm. we can say, look at this person. They may be this enormously famous public image, but we can absolutely hone in on them now, and this is what they might have been feeling. For the most recent royal events, we'll all have to wait until season six. This same cast is filming that finale now. It really was a pleasure to talk to them. And coming up, we'll have even more with this exciting new cast. Stick with us. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. But let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are out. Oh, you got it. I trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. You get one beautiful so life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We're back here on our very special crown-themed episode of Popstar Plus with more from the season five cast. They spoke to us recently about what viewers can expect. Viewers of the crown can expect in season five, it's the 1990s and the monarchy was going through a difficult time. Various members of the royal family were finding it difficult. They're all a bit older, inevitably, and yet they're coming up against it in terms of the, the way they're, they're affected by some of their private lives and personal decisions. Do you, as future king, have a duty? People will never understand how it's really been for me. I never stood a chance. Well, I think the season five, uh, what people will take from the so-called behind the scenes is that these are all events that happened in the early 90s that the, the world knows about and certainly British society knows about. And part of the fascination of the crown is that they do go behind the closed doors and provide some kind of understanding of the royals and how they dealt with these issues, either practically or emotionally. And that's the only reason the crown exists, is to show you behind the doors. I think empathy is very much in this series and has been from the very first season that they did. That's the point of a drama. If you're showing characters, whether they're real or not, surely you're inviting the audience to look at it with kind eyes, or at least try to understand the dilemmas of these characters. And I think Peter Morgan's writing allows that to happen. 
For years, I've called for a monarchy that reflects the world outside. I don't think it's my behavior that's threatening its survival. What is love, or how does love exist in a, in a system like the royal family? I think uh, love is in any family and should be in every family. And I think that when you think of the royal family, it's kind of, sometimes you can sort of think they're somehow different and separate and almost like a different breed of person. But they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're human beings with, with hearts and feelings and broken hearts and regrets and pain and grief. They are exactly the same as you and I. But of course, it's, very, it's sometimes you have to remind yourself of that. And that's what the, the Crown scripts can do. They can take us into the, the thoughts and feelings of them and show them as people separate from being royals. There's a lovely scene later on in it when Princess Margaret and Queen Elizabeth have a kind of a bit of a showdown together. And, you know, that is, that is not a scene about a monarch and a princess. It's a scene about two sisters. What counts a prohibition, incidentally? You are not now extending to Anne. That is different. How is it different? And that's what's crucial about it. And that, that affords you to go dramatically to a lot of very interesting places. As far as the Queen is concerned, and for Prince Philip, when they met, although an arranged marriage it may well have been, they were very much in love, and I think that was very lucky. But they both knew the responsibilities that, that they had going forward in their lives as the Queen and Prince Philip. So to have love as a, as, as a very good baseline, I think, helped them enormously. And I think it's the only way they could have existed for so long. To, to actually be in love, rather than just be tolerating each other for 70 years. You make a better person of me. And you of me. Isn't that the point of marriage? You know, through these, these difficult times which we're seeing in season five, uh, for many people, all our lives have difficult periods. These are highlighted because in, in England, you know, the Queen and, and Prince Philip and the royal family have been in our lives, our, our whole lives. And you just take them for granted and uh, you think, oh yeah, yeah, they're doing this, they're doing that. And of course you don't really look at them seriously or consider what they're going through, or what their lives are, not really. And Peter Morgan's trying to just give a little glimpse into what it might have been like to be faced with tragedy, with divorces, with various situations. That's what's very exciting and about this particular season. Great to hear from all of them. And we're just getting started here. Coming up, some terrific crown memories from our Today Vault. Don't go anywhere. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. I love you too. <laughs> now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now. Streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I wave. Love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> 
Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to our special crown edition of Popstar Plus. Each season of the series showcases the monarchy at a different moment in time. I was lucky enough to visit the set back in season two, going behind the scenes of the show at the time. And that's where we met Claire Foy and the rest of the cast. Take a look. It was the wedding that pulled Britain out of its wartime blues. Recreated in the Netflix hit series, The Crown, Queen Elizabeth and her handsome Prince Philip. For better, for worse. And there's more for Crown fans in season two. What is it that you'd have me change? Everything. Filmed in this stately home in the British countryside. Wow, look at this. We caught up with the cast, who was shooting the royal couple's 10th wedding anniversary dinner. Just hanging out at a banquet with the Queen. A family affair with a conspicuous late arrival by the Queen's rebellious younger sister, Margaret. A woman for the modern age, free to live. She was a Princess Diana before Princess Diana. Yes. In many ways, the same kinds of struggles. Yeah. She yeah. is royal, but doesn't get to be the boss. Yeah, but she hates. Because <laughs> she's naturally, you know. She's naturally the boss. She's naturally the boss. She's a boss. <laughs> Britain has changed beyond recognition. Setting the tone for the next decade of the Queen's life. Yet the monarchy continues its pre war routines as though nothing has happened. When the empire crumbles. When her sister Margaret gets into the spirit of the 60s. And her marriage comes under serious strain. And that we find ourselves in it. Prison. The story of the second season is partly the story of her working her way through difficulty into a happier time again with her marriage. There is no possibility of my forgiving you. On set, Claire Foy and Matt Smith are the best of friends. <laughs> They'll be replaced in season three as the characters they are portraying age. But for now, Your Majesty. Hello. Your Royal Highness. Hello. Is that the right way That's to exactly address right. you? Yeah. Is or that just, correct? Or Phil. <laughs> <laughs> you, you develop little phrases like, oh, and right, to kind of stop conversations. And I see is a good one. I see. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there she is, the Queen. <laughs> and some unexpected challenges for Matt Smith, who plays Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. You have a special kind of walk that you do that is the Duke of yeah. Edinburgh. Do you... Well, he, he walks with his hands right. behind his back. It's like Danny from Greece. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I just love that he sort of lives by his own rules, really. A little too much, perhaps. Divorce. It's not an option for us. Philip learns how to make up. Stop it and how to deal with visitors from America. Mrs. Kennedy. No curtsy. No curtsy. Who haven't read the protocol notes. Good evening, your royal majesty. Oh, I feel like that went wrong in about 10,000 different ways. I've seen worse, but I'm not sure when. <laughs> Do you think the royals are watching? We have no idea, but we love to imagine the queen with her slippers with her feet up, you know, with some fish and chips. <laughs> Just going, I don't believe that, Margaret never spoke like that, never did that. Oh yes, she did. I think they need you back on set. Do they actually? Yeah. Tea? Princess Margaret invites you for tea. Yeah. I mean, how, how good is that? Why not? <laughs> that was so fun to be part of. Next, let's revisit season three. Olivia Coleman, Helena Bonham Carter, and Tobias Menzies spoke to Joe Fryer in 2019 about taking on their royal roles. A new cast has been coronated. A great many changes. Queen Elizabeth is now played by Olivia Coleman instead of Emmy winner Claire Foy. Tobias Menzies Strong. tackles Prince Philip following in Matt Smith's footsteps. And Princess Margaret is portrayed by Helena Bonham Carter, replacing Vanessa Kirby. Here we have this immensely popular show that everyone seems to love. Up till now. And you guys get parachuted <laughs> in. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Before filming season three, the newcomers met with behind-the-scenes folks who worked on the first two seasons, including creator Peter Morgan. 
And he just said, well, you lot used to always be, used to always be so pretty. Uh, <laughs> now we've got to you. We've been employed because we're older and battered on the inside. <laughs> There are no strangers to royalty. This year, Coleman won an Oscar for playing an 18th century queen, Queen Anne, in The Favourite. Now, she's Elizabeth. It's been a harder job to do than Queen Anne, mainly because I am quite emotional and... Uh, no one knows what Queen Anne was like, anyway. Sorry. Exactly. No, you're that, quite right, that is, which is yeah. great. <laughs> the Queen, obviously, everyone is a critic. Everyone knows what she looks like. Everyone's heard her. Everyone has seen her walking. This show is a drama, but she is essentially a no-drama queen. Apparently, she is. But behind closed doors, apparently, she's an absolute hoot. She's a great mimic. She's yeah. a real laugh, isn't she? How much did you study the actual person to try and, like, imitate it, or, or did you want to add your own flair to it? I mean, it's a big part of taking on these roles, is obviously, you know, there's so much footage of them, they're so famous and well-known. You want, obviously, to get close to it, but you also don't want it to be, like, an act of mimicry, because I think that would be kind of irritating to watch for yeah. 10 hours, probably. Should I sigh and moan dramatically? One does like to fit in. You had this unusual situation where there was actors who played these roles before you. Yeah, and got Do awards for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you study them at all and how they tackle these roles? Or do you say, no, let's Queen. move on? Well, I was a huge fan of the show, and so I was sort of trying to go, what would Claire do? Yeah, I definitely <laughs> nick some ideas from that, yeah, yeah. for sure. Helena Bottom Carter actually played the mother of Princess Margaret in the King's Speech, preparing her to portray the socialite sister. And then I did meet her in real life once, and she did say, you are getting better at acting, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's hilarious because Amazing. it's in her interest that I got better, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you got the last laugh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the new season covers real life events that happened between 1964 and 77. A deadly mining tragedy, Princess Margaret's tour of the US, including a visit with President Johnson, Prince Philip's appearance on Meet the Press, and we see a young Prince Charles when he first dates Camilla. All of the stories get maybe a bit weightier. Get off! Get off! It's history that's dramatized. Still, it's a bit awkward when they see real life royals. You, you met Prince William recently, right? Uh, last year. Yeah. Yes. And he knew you were doing this. Um, yeah, so he, you know, politely going, and what are you doing? Oh, no, no, I know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you watch it? He went, no. <laughs> okay. And while the show is about the crown, both actresses admit their focus is sometimes what's on their feet. Walking in high heels without any kind of... It's quite hard to keep the shoe on, I find, and stockings. Once you know that Helly <laughs> is not very good with high heels, you've now got to re-watch it all <laughs> and watch her going... <laughs> it's, like, it's like Bambi on ice. It's really oh, yeah, well, she's not much better. Yeah. <laughs> I'm marginally better. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up next, we'll give you a refresher on season four's Diana and Charles. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. I love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Oh, yeah. I love you too. <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. I love you too. <laughs> 
welcome back to our Royal Pop Star Plus, all about The Crown. In 2020, as season four was about to be released, the third hour caught up with Josh O'Connor, who played Prince Charles, and Emma Corrin, who played Princess Diana. Why, well, see you're going to bring a deep and lasting joy to the nation. And if I may say, you both look very much in love. Oh, yes, absolutely. Whatever in love means. Oh, it's so good. I wonder what it feels like to have the whole world watching, waiting for your roles to come out. Josh and Emma join us now. Good morning to you or good afternoon uh, to you guys in London. Mm -hmm. First of all, congratulations. I mean, I mean that so sincerely. Everybody I know, everywhere, even literally have family everywhere. in other countries, uh, we're all waiting for this. Um, we want to show our viewers this side-by-side -side photo. It is amazing. Emma, can you see this? Uh, we're going to put this up. Is it true that at <laughs> first you were just brought in as a stand-in to read lines with Josh? I mean, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I was um, asked to come in and help read opposite the girls auditioning for Camilla. Um, and uh, Josh was there as well. So, yeah, that's the first time we met. And, um, yeah, it's kind of crazy thinking back. Wow, it was meant to be. And, Josh, this is now your second season playing Prince Charles. Is it true you make a scrapbook for each character you play? Uh, what can we find in your Charles scrapbook? Um, it is true. <laughs> uh, my Charles one was slightly trickier because um, normally there seems to be a kind of uh, a world which I feel closer to or understand a bit better. I think it's quite hard. It's quite hard to get your hands on gold <laughs> um, or anything too regal and royal. But uh, I found um, I have little cuttings of material because he was mm. into his suits and suiting. And then, um, yeah, the other thing was uh, I managed to get some sort of uh, some old sports kit, because that feels very English, posh, <laughs> kind of rich kid. Um, so I've got bits of that, but mostly just kind of research and writing and that sort That's of thing. Awesome. I love that. Um, you know, so what's interesting about this season, as opposed to earlier ones, is that now so many people have lived through this time period. So uh, we've lived through the history, and now we're watching you guys act it out. I mean, Emma, y you had the opportunity to even ask one of Diana's private secretaries about her, right? So what, what exactly did you learn? Um, yeah, I talked to Patrick Jepson, which was um, amazing. I think whenever, and I've, since I've met a few people who met her or have known her, and every time I do, it is so strange um, because I have no living memory of her. So it's always kind of bittersweet wow. for me to talk to mm -hmm. people who, who were close to her. But I remember him just saying how happy she was. And yeah, mm -hmm. and that made, like how she was had a very natural inclination towards happiness. Um, and if you knew her well, you always could make her laugh in an instance, um, which was so nice. Yeah. yeah. It must be nice to hear some of the stories firsthand. And, and Josh, you know, after two seasons, it's that time in The Crown where it's time to pass the role on to another actor, as, as we see happening. So what, what will you miss most about playing Prince Charles? Um, I don't know that I'm going to miss uh, specifically Charles moments, to be honest. I think the thing that I'll miss the most is uh, the unbelievable crew that work behind the camera and the cast, you know, we've we've created a family here mm -hmm. and we still have a WhatsApp group and we all still kind of stay in touch. But I think just missing out on the kind of ca uh, camaraderie of being on set with this group of people is is going to be hard. As for someone else taking on, I'm, I, I'm so excited to see whoever it is and what they do with it. And I'm sure they'll all do a terrific job. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I was just going to ask you, Emma, apparently you do a pretty good Charles with Josh and Diana needs some work. <laughs> <laughs> is this what you guys did during your breaks on set? We were it's trying true. to learn different words. What did we learn last week? Is. Is. Instead of saying years, they say, no, is. instead of saying yes. yes. Oh, instead of saying yes, you say <laughs> is. I yes. still can't even do it. Is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else you can teach us really quickly? One word. Um, my word for Diana Emma. was always all right. 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 We'll practice that right. while we watch the crowd. <laughs> Dylan, you do it. You're probably better. All right. <laughs> yes. 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 Yay. Thank you. That's great. Wow. So fun to compare the latest cast to those two. That was a great special edition of Popstar Plus. Hope all of you Crown fans out there enjoyed it. Happy binge watching. And thanks for joining me. Have a great day.
I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore is serious about his crab. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomping and grind of crabs. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty, and savory, all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you got to think Blue Crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices, and you just start whacking that bad boy. You can get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Mm. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region. But here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today, and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People have been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little, and I'm um, 25. <laughs> People from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Good to see you. How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. Pardon me. I've, I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five pants and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for her autograph, they ask her her picture, they ask her to hold their babies. You know, it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 yeah, years. Right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back? Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh-huh. There, it's like walking to somebody's home. That's they're they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel. Oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people. We were here 20 years. It's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886. Started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a 
smorgasbord of, of everything. Going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone, running in the shipping department. Well, a tray like that is about, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking. And I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you did you think you were gonna end up here? You were gonna be doing this? No, <laughs> no, but it was hard to get away from and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see, see it ending with my parents. So the pandemic hit. Yes. You really had to step up. My father called me and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's honest good, truth. <laughs> which should be a good or a bad. That's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm going to say it's been around 33, 34 years. And I started at the end of 79, uh, a week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old, and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities, but you love each other and it always works, you know, it always works well. It's, what's really, really bad is when your kids are grandfathers. Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You, 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 you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> it's just a few of them, you know? Just a few. While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Soybean. Soybean, thank you. So excited to have this And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created her recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's Crab Cake recipe? Sleep with her, she won't tell me. <laughs> he doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs. You use it's crushed broken up saltines. Saltine. Broken saltines, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients it's together, right. nothing more. That's right. And the Fine. big ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. Oh, look at this. Oh, boy. It was just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living 
pulling in Maryland's most famous catch. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> you get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. But let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are out. I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well, he grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman, and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There was more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole east coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forged their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise is essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. Yeah. How they biting today? This morning it's been pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do and let nobody tell you, go get me this or go get me that. 75-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning, before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, I was bay 15, and I've been at it ever since. 
Right now, uh, I'm going down the line, and uh, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. Not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got all the jobs, and it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall, but changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black water, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, you know, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it'll be no chance of no more black water. I really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught high as 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise. And educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. It, it, it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next, an up and coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking. You'll get one beautiful Someday. life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just like get to the point. They have started to vote on the pact. Act. If you're like, Kelly, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. You'll get one beautiful so life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. <laughs> Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. You'll get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. I love you too. <laughs> now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Back in Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. 
I'm an artist at heart. So uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, crab, crab is king in Baltimore, so um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back to that and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in D.C., so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side. And pretty much I've um, always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food. So learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watched my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you have people standing in line hundreds of people <laughs> on the block and in, in that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was it was just may, it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Hi. Natasha. My big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, the people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know? Coming up, I'm going to grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crap. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. Yeah. You are oh, I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. Well, I know I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. So you're able to add a little bit. Yeah, but he's always asked me uh, when I fix the dish, well, what did you put in this? How did you do? How did you do this? And I would tell him. I said, you don't have to follow to the letter. You know, put your own spin. And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. Genius! The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, 
egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and microgreens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right, patient's ready. So how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first we want to do is say we have some uh, Maryland jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. uh, typically uh, I like to sift through it. Just gotta see if there's any shells, and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So, Gloria, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> this sauce particular is our, our crab sauce mix. So okay. we're going to drizzle a little bit at a time. I don't want to put too much. Right. Just enough to uh, bind. You got enough for Al? Yep, I think I'll have enough. Oh, she's she's stay I like this. I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about you know when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh huh. Gonna start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why? Why? Why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular at the restaurant? The most popular. Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a, a bar more favorite and you know, make it handheld and on, on the go, uh -huh. you know, throw in your hand. Kind of a street food. Really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's, it's very popular, other than the taste as well. Right, well, exactly. you know, <laughs> yeah, because that's You can take taste. it with you, but if it's not right, right, taste, exactly. you uh, come back for it. Yeah, so what we're going to um, do is uh, we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh, crab, it's around like a yeah, quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. They're gonna sit in the middle. Is that too yeah. much? Yeah, we wanna take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, we wanna put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> All right, so that's perfect right there. Right, perfect, sorry. perfect. <laughs> and we're gonna Just literally fold them up envelope style. What, what is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is a uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Hey, Lord, is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. No. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! Done! Was faster than I did. Wow! <laughs> Wow, that natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're gonna get get the deep fryer up here and fry these bad boys up. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Woo! If you had to describe the heart of your cuisine, what is it and, and how does Baltimore uh, kind of be part of that? Pretty much my, my story. And I think that connects very well to our Baltimore, you know, because you know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life. And I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about that. And it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore. And they, they watched my journey through the years. And I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I do. Make sure to get around the edges and then things like that. So that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't fry uh -huh. on one particular side too much. And, Want to even fry? Ooh. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally. So, yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made, and this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet, has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah, and that's the piece. Yes, <laughs> yes. Crab cake egg roll. Yeah. Here we go. Wow. Chef Alex, you have done Baltimore proud. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls, and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true, food tastes better when you eat it with family. I'm 
Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post and I Know Trends. Each week, I'm here with the must-have fashion and beauty products at a price you'll like in Style Finder. I'm Shop All Day contributor Makon Dovu, and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media in influencer trends. And I'm Shop All Day contributor Jen Fallick, and I love finding the best versions of everyday items in Better Basics. This is Shop All Day, Comfy Cozy. Hi, I'm Chassie Post, and we're back today with another episode of Shop All Day. Tis the season for cooler weather and a great excuse to get comfy and cozy. We're talking fleece lined leggings, comfortable moccasins, and loungewear galore. And if this time of year has you craving a warm bath and a cup of hot tea, we have must have items for you too. And remember, see that QR code at the bottom of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. So let's get to it. First, when I want to de-stress before the holidays, you know what I love to do? Pull on a pair of irresistibly soft PJs and take a load off. And these satin takes on the classic men's style pajamas are the ultimate in stylish loungewear. They make me feel like I'm at a luxurious spa retreat that just happens to be in my own home. And I wish you could feel this fabric. It is so incredibly soft. It is like a satin poly blend that is the feel of silk, but not the price of silk, which we love. And I am always excited when I see a great looking pair of classic men's style pajamas. This set comes in two pieces. It's got the button down top and the pull on pant, which has an elastic waistband. So they're roomy, but I also love all of these high end details. So we've got the classic notch collar. We've got the contrast piping. We have the wonderful pocket here. And of course, all these great little cuff details. Everything you look for in a great classic men's PJ. And they come in so many different colors and patterns. Check out the navy stripe. Have you ever seen anything chicer? And I have to say that the pajama trend has actually been a big trend on the runways too. We've seen lots of designers creating looks that are not just meant to be worn for lounging, that resemble pajamas. And these would make a great gift for anyone on your list if you're planning ahead. So now let's talk knits. We're always on the hunt for a sweater that is over the top soft and we hit the jackpot with the cozy up rib sweater from Aerie. Yep, it's a 10 out of 10. And this little sweater here, oh, it is so incredibly soft as well. And it's actually made with Aerie's softest yarn yet, which is really saying something. And it's actually a stretch yarn. So this knit, the sweater, it's stretch, which makes it even more comfortable to wear. And I really like the silhouette. I mean, it's a little oversized. It's got a drop sleeve here and it's tunic length, which I love. Gives you a little bit more coverage when you're wearing leggings or your skinny jeans. And it's also got a lot of high-end details. This exposed seams, and I also like the little notch here on the hem. So these sweaters come in eight different colors and they are such a great deal. When it gets cold outside, we need a legging that will rise to the challenge. And these popular fleece line leggings are not just comfy, but so warm and cozy. And these are the legging you will reach for again and again this winter. And what I like so much about these leggings is they're super duper versatile. So they're great for all your outdoor activities or for working out, but they're also comfortable enough so that you can hang out on the couch or run around doing your errands. And these leggings are incredibly popular. They have over 15,000 ratings. And what shoppers love so much about these leggings is they are so warm. They're lined with a low pile fleece and they're insulating. But the good news is, they're also really flattering, which you can't say about every you know, fleece line legging out there. They're made with a fabric that has a four-way stretch. I mean, check that out. And 13% spandex. So they suck you in a little bit, but they're still comfy enough that you can hang out on the couch in these. 
And another thing that shoppers love so much about them is that they have pockets. Ah, you can put your phone in there. They also have a hidden pocket at the waist that you can hide your key in. And the cut is super flattering. High-waisted, so no muffin top, ladies. You gotta love that. And they come in 17 different colors and are incredibly affordable. And now that we're getting comfy, let's take an even deeper dive into Cozy. We've got the best-selling shearling slippers from Heritage Brand LL Bean for the whole family that aren't just good, they're wicked good. No, really, that's their name. And these moccasins are also wicked popular. The brand says that they've sold over 4 million pair over the past five years. And in December, their peak month, they say they sell one pair every seven seconds. So that's pretty popular. And here's a fun fact, shearling is actually moisture wicking. So no sweaty feet. You gotta love that, right? And I also love that they have a great rubber sole. So technically, you could wear these inside or out. Now here's what I think sends these moccasins over the edge for me. They make them for the entire family, from the littlest toddler to adults. And check it out. You can do a mommy and me, or a daddy and me, or a whole family moccasin situation. And they come in lots of colors and cute patterns like plaid. These are such a winner. We all need a sock that's got your back by way of your feet. These dreamy, super soft, cozy chenille socks by Ugg are the ultimate in comfort. They're like a magical instant relaxation device. You put them on and instantly your feet are enveloped with a soothing softness that begs you to put your feet up. And I know that you guys know the Ugg boot, but did you know that Ugg makes socks that are just as comfortable? So these are made with the chenille thread. They're knit in a confetti pattern. And what's so great about these socks is you can wear them all year long instead of slippers. But if you want to carry that dreaminess around with you throughout the day, you can also wear these socks with your winter boots. And these socks come in seven different colors, and these are a sock that's gonna give back. So what could be more comfy and cozy than a chill pill? <gasps> chill pill bath bomb, that is. These fizzy adult bath bombs from beloved beauty brand Way just might inspire you to take a little well-deserved me time and time to recharge. How cute is this little concept, right? The chill pill. So the obsession is real with these chill pills. They are so luxurious. I mean, they really do make you feel like you're getting away on a fabulous spa retreat. And this brand was actually founded by Jen Atkin, who's a celebrity hairstylist. You met her on our show a couple of months ago. And what people love so much about about these chill pills. These are so easy to use. All you do is snap and sink into a warm tub and get ready to relax. So these not only help to cleanse, but they also help to moisturize. They're infused with jojoba oil. They're infused with sapler oil, hemp oil, and they really do encourage you to get a little zen. And lastly, just when you thought it couldn't get any cozier, we couldn't help ourselves from sharing a very modern take on some of the plushest loungewear you've ever seen or felt. So this is the Skims Teddy Collection. And yes, you guys have heard of Skims. It's Kim Kardashian West's line, and it is really an innovative line. I am so excited about sort of the twist they've done on that teddy trend. So normally we think of the teddy fleece as maybe an outdoor outerwear fabric, but this brand has taken the texture of Teddy and made it so incredibly soft. You just want to snuggle up in it, and that's what people do, of course. And what's also really cool about this brand, they've taken that whole concept of loungewear, and they've really modernized it with the silhouettes. We've got a full-length zip-up jacket, but we've also got this wonderful crop jacket that zip up. They also have wonderful silhouettes for bottoms, like the great wide-leg track pant that are just as cozy as they are fashionable. And 
one of my absolute favorite things about this collection and Skims in general is that they've really pioneered along with Yeezy the whole new nude trend, the new neutral. And I think all of these wonderful nude colors are based on beautiful skin tones and they feel so modern. So this truly is a very fashion forward way to do loungewear. So let's run through all the products one more time. We've got the Women's Classic Pajama Set, the Airy Cozy Up Rib Sweater, the Thermal Leggings, the L.L. Bean Wicked Good Moccasins for men, women, and kids, the Ugg Socks, the Way Chill Pills, and the Skims Teddy Collection. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. That's it for Style Finder. Up next, Mako and Logu is talking style and comfort. And later, Jen Fallick has plush robes and bath caddies. Sign me up. Don't go away. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are, oh, I was you trying got it. to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are, oh, I was you got it. trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Hello there, welcome back. I'm Makon Jovu, and this is Influencer Trends, where I'll be talking to industry insiders and they'll share their favorite products and the must-have items to shop for right now. And don't forget the QR code at the bottom of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products. Okay, I am so excited to chat with fashion expert Melissa Garcia because even when you are comfy cozy, it doesn't mean you can't be stylish while relaxing. Hi, Melissa. So good to have you here. Oh, it's so, so good to be here with you guys. I so enjoy seeing you and being here. And of course, we're going to talk about amazing cozy stuff. So what better than that? All right, let's talk about it. So now that the weather is getting cooler, Melissa, what are some of your favorite ways to get your comfy, cozy vibes on? It's funny because I'm not a big fan of the cold. I don't, are you? I, mean, I usually like warm weather. The same? Same. Yeah, but there's something really special about like just staying home and putting on like cozy PJs and getting by the fire on your couch and just getting like warm and cozy. So I do love that part of it. I do too. And I have to be honest, when I'm at home and I'm comfy cozy, I look a hot mess. So what is <laughs> what are some ways to get your comfy cozy vibes on but while still looking stylish? So listen, and 
I'll be, I'm, I'm a fashionista, so okay. I'm the person to say fashion is important. However, I think there's an exception. When you're home and you want to be cozy and comfy, I think all rules go out the door. Wear whatever you want and just be warm and comfy and cozy. So I'm putting that out there. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay, let's get started with the first item, which by the way, I'm so glad you brought all these picks for us. It's actually called the comfy. Yes. So this goes along the lines of what I was just saying. There's sometimes you have to sacrifice fashion for comfort and warmth. And this is absolutely one of those times. It's the best $45 you'll ever probably spend. My entire family has one of these. So they are ginormous. They're one size fits all. They are the coziest, yummiest. The inside is like this yummy, warm Sherpa. And it's like this huge blanket that you oh. wear. It is incredible. I'm telling you, myself, my husband, we all have our own. And you'll find us on the couch, snuggled up in this, nice and toasty warm. It's amazing. <laughs> I am obsessed with the fact that you have the color black, because listen, I mean, I know it's machine washable, but after I'm comfy and cozy, I'm not gonna throw it in the machine after every wash. No. <laughs> so I love that, and it's one size fits all as well. Okay, let's move on to the next item, which by the way is this beanie, which has the word cozy in its title. How cool is that? I know, and it is the coziest, comfiest beanie. You know, when your head is warm, it really maintains so much of your body temperature and your heat. But this one is really special because again, fashion is my wheelhouse and not all beanies are the same. I have to say they all might look the same, but they don't all fit the same. And this one not only is really comfortable and cozy, has that cute pom-pom on the top, but it's also an incredible fit. It fits your head perfectly. It's not too thick and chunky. There's not too much extra fabric on top that kind of flops around. It's really the perfect fit. And I love that they have the perfect neutral colors to choose from, whites, grays, tans, beiges, like mm -hmm. black, of course. Those are the colors you really want. And of course, we don't always want to do our hair. A beanie is the perfect thing to throw on when you want to look pulled together, so but you don't have time. That's so true. Listen, we do comfy and cozy at home, but like if you're going out to a football game, it's the perfect thing to cover up like a bad hair day or just like when you have your hair down. Love it. Let's move on to the pajamas, the flannel pajamas. So cool. Tell me about them. So I love a great pair of flannel pajamas, and these are like the ultimate in flannel pajamas. I think when we all really think about flannel PJs, L.L. Bean automatically comes to mind, and there's a reason why. It's because they're the highest quality flannel. They're made of Portuguese flannel. They have a ton of color options. They're so super soft. They're they're warm, but they're not too thick that you're going to overheat in them. I love them. They're great. A perfect piece of clothing to add into your sort of cozy repertoire this season. And also a great gift for yourself or someone you love. I was just thinking about that, that I might gift them either to my sister or my husband. Is it cheesy? Is it not stylish that I want us to match together for the holidays? I love that. I think it's adorable. Listen, again, all rules go out the door of the holidays. Wear whatever you want. Match, match your dog, match everyone. <laughs> match everyone. Okay, you said all rules go out of the door, but my number one rule for just relaxing at home and getting really, really cozy is I gotta have hot chocolate. Let's talk about this pic. I mean, it's just so cozy. Oh my gosh, a girl after my heart. I am a chocolate fanatic. It's a problem. And <laughs> this hot cocoa is next level hot cocoa. Because normally you're used to those powdered hot cocos, right? Right. But when you open this one up and you see it, it's actual chocolate oh. shaving. The only thing that's missing is a marshmallow on top. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. I am all set for my night in. Oh my God, I wish I had one too. Mm -hmm. Here, <laughs> take a sip for me. <laughs> I'll take an extra sip for you. Thanks, Melissa. Those were great tips. Now let's run through all the products one more time. The Comfy, the Abercrombie and Fitch Cozy Palm Beanie, the L.L. Bean flannel pajamas, and the William Sonoma hot chocolate. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. Up next, Jim Fallick has plush robes and all you need for a cozy night in in the cool season. Don't go away. You'll get one beautiful life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Um, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Um, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals plus bonus content, and everything is ad free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Everyone. Welcome back to Shop All Day. I'm Shop All Day contributor Jen Fallick. This episode has been all about getting comfy and cozy, and I have the latest must-have items to create the calm before the holiday storm at home. From plush robes to a bath caddy that will make your bath feel more like a spa. And see the QR code at the bottom of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. So let's get to it. We're gonna start with the ultimate symbol of comfy, cozy season, and that is a good, soft throw. This one is a personal favorite. This is the throw that my family, we fight over it every night. It's a luxury throw, comes in 43 colors and three different sizes. The reason that we love this one so much is there's nothing softer. There's different versions, so you can get one that's dual-sided with Sherpa and fur. This one is dual-sided with Sherpa and shag. This is my personal favorite one. So it's somehow really light, but also just feels warm and cozy. You can bundle yourself up in it. You can choose which side you want. If you want to go with the Sherpa side, you want to go with the shag side or faux fur. And it also gives you styling options. If you want it to look a little dressier, you can choose one side versus in a room that feels a little more casual, you can flip it onto the other. Also, they're machine washable. We use these every single day, so it's wonderful to know that I can just throw them in the washer dryer and have a fresh one every night. Now, once you're snuggled up in this, trust me, you're not gonna wanna get out of it. Once I'm bundled up in my blanket, the last thing I wanna do is get up, run to the kitchen, do other things like that. So I am obsessed with this next product. These tea drops are the best way to get a perfect cup of tea every single time with zero effort. You take this drop right here, and see it's already made for you. Drop it right into your cup of tea. You can use it for iced tea too. The brand says that all the ingredients in these tea drops are finely sourced. There's organic elements, there's spices, there's fine sugars from all over the globe. So you're getting a delicious cup of tea with top of the line ingredients. But now that we're talking comfy cozy, I like to think of it in a cup of warm water, drop it in, let it dissolve, and minutes later, you have the perfect cup of tea and you don't have to get up and Throw out a tea bag. You don't have to worry if you have the right infuser tool. There's different versions too. You can go with sweetened or unsweetened. And there's flavors like blueberry acai. There's a rose earl gray. My daughter loves the citrus ginger because that has no caffeine. It also says on the package, it gives you an indication of if it's caffeinated, if it's not, and if it is caffeinated, how caffeinated it is. Very helpful for me when I'm trying to dole out tea every night to my kids. Moving on to screen-free serenity. You know, a lot of us already know that coloring is a great way to mentally unwind. It's definitely trending and it is not just for kids. It is such a great comfy, cozy indoor activity for those chilly fall and winter nights. And this coloring book, I personally use, I love it. 
my kids keep stealing it from me, it is a total win. It's the Bandeau Brighten Up Coloring Book. And the reason that this is so amazing for adults is that the designs in it are sourced from 12 different artists from all over the globe. And they're actually drawings that even if you're not naturally an artist, when you color them in, it looks professional. And it's not just fridge worthy, these puppies are frame worthy. I love the designs in here. Side note, they're best used with either crayons or colored pencils because you don't want the color to bleed through the page. The sheets can be torn off, so if you're hanging out with friends or if other people want to color, if you want to put it up, you can easily tear off the perforated pages. And it's just such a relaxing, screen-free way to unwind, to let your mind relax, and to sort of embrace your inner child and your inner creativity without having to worry about coloring inside the lines. Some like coloring books, others prefer a warm bath to unwind. And if you want to take a warm bath, you're gonna need this Amazon bath caddy. I get really antsy in the bath. I know you're supposed to soak for a certain number of minutes. Everyone says, you know, 20 minutes, 15 minutes. After three minutes, I'm itching to get out and see what else I need to get done. What's great about this bath caddy is that you can have everything that you need to keep yourself occupied in the tub right at arm's reach. You can put a book down, you can put your iPad there if you wanna watch something on the screen. There's a spot for a cup of tea or coffee. You can even put a glass of wine. There's a little ledge for a candle. So it really has room for everything that you may need once you get in the tub and you don't wanna get out to get. It allows you to sit, soak, and relax for as long as you'd like. This one is better basic worthy because it's adjustable. So no matter the size of your tub, this typically can fit multitude of sizes and it's bamboo, so it's high quality and lightweight, but it's covered in a waterproof varnish. So even if it gets a little bit wet, no harm, no foul. If you wanna take your serene soak to the next level, you need a bath fizzer to go along with your bath caddy. This one is from Uncommon Goods, and look at these, they look like little rock candies. I mean, they look delicious and they smell amazing. What I love about the bath fizzers, it's sort of like an upgraded new version of a traditional bath bomb. You just take it, swirl it around in the tub when you've got them filled with warm water. It fizzes up into the most delicious smelling fizzy bath. I've been trying them all. I love the lemon scented one. And it just takes the whole bath experience to the next level. Plus, if you're thinking of gifting, this is a great gift because most people don't have this. The bath fizzer is a really new and interesting way to take your bath to the next level. So now that you've had your bath, you need the plush robe. After a bath, you really want to be extra comfy, extra cozy, wrap yourself up in this. This is from Target. It's the Women's Cozy Plush Robe, and uh, it's the softest thing ever. I love this brand, actually. It's from Stars Above. This brand is my go-to for pajamas, because with their pajamas, I find that they're really soft and comfy, but they never feel heavy. And the robe is the exact same thing. It feels so plush and soft, but it doesn't feel like it weighs you down. It doesn't make you feel uncomfortably hot. The style, of course, the classic with the shawl, the wrap so you can give yourself a little tie, and the key, you've gotta have pockets. This has two really great deep pockets. Put this on after the bath, put your remote in one pocket, your uh, snack or your phone in the other, and you are good to go. There's four different colors to choose from, and I just love this soft velvety finish. So now that you are all relaxed and you're comfy cozy as can be, Let's talk about the one thing that you need to get comfy cozy the second you get into bed and fall off into an amazing night of sleep. This is the Nod Pod. If you have never seen the Nod Pod before, you've gotta get familiar with this thing. This basically is like a weighted blanket, but for your eyes. It has just a little bit of weight to it, so when you put it on, it sinks right onto your face. It blocks out all the light, making it easier to fall asleep. And it's dual-sided, so you've got a sort of warm side and a cool side. If you want something a little cooling, you want something a little toasty, you can even put this in the fridge or warm it up in the microwave to give it a little extra boost. The kicker with this, what makes it so interesting, is that the way it ties in the back, it doesn't create a lump. It lays totally flat. So if you want to lay back and just chill, this isn't going to give you that uncomfortable bump. There's a lot of fun colors to choose from too. And when it comes to ending your comfy, cozy night on the perfect note, this is gonna win every single time. Let's go through these products one more time and you can use the QR code to get instant access to these items. We've got the Luxury Throw Blanket, the Tea Drop from Uncommon Goods, 
the Bandeau Brighten Up Coloring Book, the Bath Caddy, the Uncommon Goods Rock Candy Bath Fizzer, the Target Women's Cozy Plush Robe, and the Nod Pot. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And that's a wrap on all of your better basics and for our show. It's been fun showing you our favorites. Tune in next Thursday for another episode of Shop All Day. That's a beautiful piece of chicken. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. Comfort food. From a decadent cheeseburger, to a sky-high layer cake, or my favorite, my mom's spicy warming doll. Usually these indulgent eats aren't exactly vegan friendly. Even many traditional doll recipes are often prepared with ghee. But these days you can easily ditch the dairy and you won't even miss the meat with new plant-based takes on traditional comfort foods being served at restaurants all across the country. In Portland, I'm meeting a chef making crunchy fried chicken without the bird. And in New York, I'm sampling a Big Apple staple, cheesecake. But this one happens to be raw and vegan. But first up, I'm heading to Los Angeles, my hometown, to visit a popular fast food chain serving up show-stopping burgers without the beef. Growing up in SoCal, there was nothing more comforting than grabbing a burger by the beach and cruising down the Pacific Coast Highway. Monty's Good Burger in LA is recreating that iconic experience for a plant-based generation. Everything here, from a melty cheeseburger to fully loaded fries and even their creamy milkshakes is totally vegan. Lexi Jarris is the co-founder of the Up and Coming chain. What inspired you to start this place? I and my partners, it, it was a time in the vegan space in LA where there wasn't just a really good casual vegan burger. I felt like in order to get that like fix for a burger, I had to go somewhere with like white tablecloths and like you had to be waited on. In 2018, Lexi founded Monty's with Bill Fold and Nick Adler. Lexi and Bill both work in the music industry. He's a festival producer, and Lexi is a creative consultant for Coachella. Nick brought the culinary chops as a former food director for music festivals. I think because we all come from music, when it came time to like market and brand and like strategize how to grow, we were all coming at it from such like a non-traditional viewpoint. The Monty's team runs their business differently from many restaurants. They focus on creating digital buzz with celebrity milkshake collabs, pop-ups at festivals, and lots of merch. While Monty's now has five locations and millions of burgers sold, they make more money from their swag, like hats, t-shirts, and mugs, than the food. The star of said merch and the brand's namesake is Lexi's adorable schnoodle mix. How did Monty become the mascot? He's so lucky. Crazy. He's a lucky pup. He's very lucky. <laughs> he was found essentially on the streets of Riverside, which is kind of nuts. We looked for his owners. They were nowhere to be found. So after a few weeks, I was like, this is my, this is my son now. But it really kind of, again, kind of goes to show like the playfulness and like the headspace we were in when we started Monty's. Do work a lot with animal rescues now, and that is kind of something that's like in our ethos. We care a lot about animals, obviously, um, but not just <laughs> eating less of them, but also giving some like fluffy guys and then around the LA area homes. Monty's is dedicated to getting pets adopted, from dogs to cats and even guinea pigs. But their main mission is to change how people see vegan food. I think what's really interesting is that there is this stigma and this stereotype that vegan food has to be super healthy, right? When I first became vegan, a lot of my friends that aren't vegan would have dinner with me and they would leave and be like, I'm still hungry. I hate when Lexi picks the restaurant. I think if you come here, 
I highly doubt that someone will leave here. I mean, still being hungry. It's, it's lots of tots, lots of shake, lots of burger. To me, I feel that anytime someone is eating a plant-based meal instead of a meal that has like dairy, meat, whatever, that's just kind of a win for like the animals, the planet, their health, all that good stuff. I love that. Tell me about the future of Monty's. Where do you want to take this? Yes, I mean, honestly, like, the sky's the limit. Like, I don't want to say too big, but we're all definitely thinking, like, as big as America wants us to be. Amazing. I'm so hungry now. <laughs> I want everything. I will order every single day. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. This guy, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are, oh, I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Monty's Good Burger is reimagining fast food for a new era. Co-founder Lexi Jarris introduced me to Gemma Kessler, the chain's operation manager. Gemma trains new chefs on how to cook the entire menu, which includes a plant-based chicken sandwich and fully loaded fries. And she's teaching me how to make the restaurant's signature item. Okay, Gemma, you are gonna show me how to make the Monty's Good Burger. Let's do it. Let's I think go. You're ready. Making a Monty's Burger isn't all that different from prepping a beef patty. First up, Gemma oils the grill so the Impossible patties don't stick. And then we're gonna smash those patties down. So I am going to use both spatulas and really get that squeezing out the edges there, as you can see. Nice. Number one. Number two. Perfect. Awesome. And now we're gonna have those just crisp up and cook on one side, and then we're gonna flip them. Flip it! Check Gorgeous. that out. Good thing I didn't screw that up on camera. <laughs> right. Next up, two slices of vegan cheese. And now I'm gonna have you spray a little bit of water on the outside there, creating some steam. All right. Perfect. Nice, that's gonna get all melty and melty, delicious. Melty, cheesy, delicious. We love it. Next, we're going to raise this and add some grilled onions. My favorite. <laughs> this is like your entire store of grilled Amazing. onions. All right, perfect. Perfect, perfect. All right, and that's that is it. ready to go. To finish the burger, we get the perfect toast on our buns. See you later. <laughs> Time for the Monty's house bread. It's similar to a Thousand Island sauce. And what burger is complete without a pickle? Three juicy house-made pickles. Now the patty meets the bun. It's your bottom this bun. This is the best part of my day. Okay. <laughs> this is going straight on here. There you go. I feel like I'm hired. I don't want to be forward, but okay. I think you might be. <laughs> this is the final step though. This is the important part. Okay. To build it all together. All right. Yeah, but you're gonna fold that forward. Gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I am so excited to eat this. I want to try everything else on your menu. Should we go find Lexi? Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, I'm so Ready? Excited. Cheers. Ready? Cheers. Bye. Okay. I can't. It's just good to remember. It's better. This is so insane. It's because it has your touch. Lexi, what does it mean to you to have this amazing and plant-based contribution to California burger culture? This is our Culver City location, so this is definitely our most 
family friendly location. We have customers that like come in strollers with their parents, obviously, <laughs> and they get like pins and stickers and things like that. But like these kids are gonna grow up with us around the corner from us. I think that's so just, like brings me a lot of joy. Especially growing up in California, and this was such a big part of my culture. Like getting a burger whenever going to the beach, and yeah. I feel like I can have that experience again in a play based way. So thank you and cheers. It means the world. Thank you so much. <laughs> have to take a picture, please, because this just feels right. We love photos around here. Cheers. This juicy burger had me craving more comfort food. So I'm off to Portland, where one vegan chef with a unique story is putting his own twist on Southern soul food. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Uh, yeah, I love you too. One beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah, I love you too. <laughs> the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Portland, Oregon is one of the best cities for plant-based living. From vegan donuts in every flavor imaginable, to the world's first all-vegan barbecue joint, there is no shortage of delicious veggie-forward fare here. One of my favorite spots is Dirty Lettuce, a vegan soul food eatery helmed by a chef breaking barriers. This is Super very tasty. visually impressive. Like, this literally is taking me back to like a KFC bucket. Yes. Alkabulon Morosky is the chef and founder of Dirty Lettuce. How do you feel like you're making vegan food more accessible, more equitable, something that is digestible, no pun intended, yeah. <laughs> to a wider audience? I feel like a lot of the vegan industry for a long time has had this very, very heavy focus on like making it as healthy and holistic as possible. And that is very important, but it's like there's a reason why McDonald's is like the colossal juggernaut it is. Because sometimes people just want to be able to eat something greasy and delicious and feel good in their stomach. <laughs> Alcabalon's soul food recipes are rooted in the southern cooking traditions from their hometown of Jackson, Mississippi. You grew up in Mississippi, pescatarian, so eating a lot of veggies, no meat. Can you talk to me about what that was like, especially in the South, a very meat-heavy culture? Yeah, it was, it was one of the things that made me want to do this, was I spent my whole childhood in the South, like, surrounded by lots of fascinating cuisine, like gumbos, etouffees, and whatnot. I remember always wanting to be able to try and enjoy these different foods and never really having the opportunity to, and until I decided to just do it myself. For instance, it means like cookouts are a really, really big thing in the South. And if you don't eat a lot of animal products, then you generally can't really go and engage with them to the same extent everyone else can. Growing up in the South was challenging in different ways for Al Kabulon, who is biracial and identifies as gender neutral. 
Did you feel like you had a sense of belonging growing up? I definitely don't really describe myself as a very masculine, per masculine person, but being a person that most people ID as just like a black man when they see me meant that there was a lot of intense pressure to like put on a performance of masculinity that just wasn't me at all. And I wonder, was that a reason why you started cooking? Was it a way for you to find a sense of belonging in any way? I did really enjoy when I first started messing around with these recipes in the South was being able to go to people who I'd known for years and were very, very against just like general vegan cooking or like, I need my meat. <laughs> and being able to come up with something and feed it to them and have them actually enjoy it and be able to go like, okay, this didn't come from a dead animal, but I'm actually enjoying my meal. Alcabalon's mother, who is also a vegetarian, taught them how to cook. And there were always tons and tons of cookbooks all over my household. They loved working with seitan and started developing a line of plant-based meats after college. But in 2019, a new law was proposed in Mississippi that changed Alcabalon's career path. I'd already been devising recipes to move somewhere else for quite a while. And then the Mississippi legislature decided they were going to introduce a bill that would actually ban the labeling of any plant-based product as any kind of meat. While the law ultimately was halted in court, it was a signal for Al Cabalon to pack their bags and head west. Why did you choose Portland? So I actually had a marvelous opportunity here. So I started off in Portland in a vegan food pod. So it was like supposed to be the first vegan food pod to appear in the US. That pod was Shady Pines Food Court, the country's first all vegan food cart park that opened in early 2020. While Shady Pines shuttered a year later, it helped introduce Alcabalon's food to the city's vibrant culinary community. I was definitely very well received and I got to be part of the publicity of like a vegan food pod, all vegan. One year after launching their cart, Alcabalon was able to open a brick and mortar spot in 2021. Here, the chef experiments with new seitan meat swaps for southern staples like pork ribs and catfish. I think in a lot of restaurants, if you go and order three different things made of seitan, you're going to get roughly the same seitan prepared in different ways. But I actually make a point to have like a completely different protein blend for each different fake meat that I do. Speaking of all this food, I'm starving. I'm not gonna lie, I caught a glimpse of that fried chicken and I think I might need it. Ooh, well, how about if we get back to this kitchen? I'm ready, <laughs> let's do it. All right. <laughs> make your iconic fried chicken out of seitan. Can you tell me about what seitan is and how you make this delicious chicken? Oh yeah, so seitan is essentially, it is pure, it is a mass of pure wheat gluten protein. Actually you would make it by just like taking regular wheat flour and washing it and until you have like a sticky protein left over. But these days you can just buy like the dehydrated gluten on its own, which is what we have here, mixed with a whole bunch of different spices. Alcabalon adds a liquid mixture to the wheat gluten. This is the secret behind the different meat textures. Yeah, and the idea that depending on how much like oil, fat, and water you have in your wet blend, you're gonna end up with a different final product of your seitan. The next step is similar to making bread. The seitan and liquid mixture are kneaded together. Like it doesn't feel like dough. Yeah. You know, it feels like it's something like, that has a lot more texture and, and pull to it. Yeah, the weird pseudo dough. <laughs> <laughs> it's very much a pseudo dough. <laughs> the dough transforms into seitan after simmering in veggie stock. After the seitan cools, it's cut into fillets and soaked overnight. Then the seitan is ready to be breaded and fried. Here is the chicken. A major thing for me with all my seitan is I try to deliberately make them as irregular as possible. Because mm. if you get like an actual piece of meat from an animal, it's not going to be it's a uniform perfect. disc. Right, yeah. right. The process starts with a healthy sprinkle of cayenne. Then, just like a regular dredge, it's covered in flour and a secret spice mix. The egg-free wet mixture is where things really get interesting. Oh yeah, so this is just a blend of mustard, water, a little bit of cornstarch, and my house spice blend. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mustard, why mustard? You'll see it sometimes in like old southern fried chicken recipes, yeah, but it's yeah. not nearly as common as you'll see, just like your standard egg or buttermilk wash. It's not as much a flavor thing as like a texture thing. Mustard is kind of acidic in a way that reacts with your breading. So yeah, going from there, we get right over into our second dry bath. Oh. And from oh. here, we get pretty weird with it. This is where we're actually building that texture of the chicken by hand. How do you do that? You just kind of... Yeah, so we start by just sort of 
coating chicken, coating our breading on there, getting a nice pasty, goopy mix. So yeah, that's how it's like, that looks like very rough and all over the place, but that's roughly what a piece of chicken is gonna look like before we fry it. Wow. It's like very rough, very lumpy. Yeah, well, check that out. Oh, how cool. <laughs> Do you trust me to make one? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we get these into some oil. Okay. Oh, yes. Let's do it. The seitan chicken fries in canola oil until it's golden brown. Oh, I yeah. loved my fried chicken, and then I went plant-based, and I never had fried chicken. So this oh, is yeah. an exciting. That, that's moment. my goal. It's like let people have all the tasty things yeah. they ate growing up and not yeah. feel guilty about it. Yeah. Right, They're probably looking. just about ready to. Pull this up. That is looking pretty happy. That's definitely like the go-to signature is just getting those proper flakes. Wait, do you hear this? You got that? I think you eat with all of your senses, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Cheers. All right, <laughs> going for it. Stop. <laughs> like, I know you know this is good, but... That's usually the response I go for. <laughs> it's so well, good. <laughs> the, like, Oh my god, I can't even speak. The breading is insane. It literally tastes like chicken. One of the things I realized as I started messing with more and more vegan meats is that a lot of what people associate with a lot of traditional meats that they've eaten is not actually the protein itself, but just the way it's prepared. Right. Cheers, this is delicious. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for joining. But as delicious as Al Cable on Seitan is, their bigger goal is making vegan food more approachable. How do you think that you're making vegan food more equitable? A lot of people, it's like vegan food in general, I think is still a bit overpriced in most markets. Well, honestly, a big thing for me is I try to make sure that if I offer any product on my menu and make sure I can provide people with like a big hefty portion size and not charge them $35 for one meal. <laughs> Up next, a Brooklyn sweet shop that's ditching the dairy and creamy cheesecake. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. I love you too. <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Simply Sweet, a vegan dessert shop in Brooklyn, specializes in raw desserts. That means nothing on the menu is heated above 104 degrees, so you won't find any ovens in here. Opened in 2019, Simply Sweet makes treats that are free from gluten and refined sugar. You'll find anything here to satisfy a sweet tooth, from chocolate bars to creamy cakes and fruity acai bowls. Because I love sweets, everything sweet, I love desserts and caramel and fruits, everything sweet. <laughs> Alessia Mirpocheyeva is the owner and head pastry chef. She moved to the U.S. from Russia in 2012. After landing in New York, Alessia quickly got her start in the food industry at Juice Press, then a fast-growing smoothie and organic food chain with a celebrity following. I fell in love with their food and smoothies and juices, and when I got there, it was like, 
different world because uh, I've never heard about some ingredients like maca powder, goji berries. I'm like, what? <laughs> Alessia also worked as a line cook at a private school in Manhattan. That's where she truly fell in love with cooking, whipping up delicious baked goods for the students. When Alessia became a mother a few years ago, she decided to start an eatery of her own. Can you tell me about why you started Simply Sweet? When I was pregnant, I was thinking how I'm going to feed my baby when he's born. And when he uh, was growing up, and then he started to uh, pick food from my plate. I thought <laughs> I'm gonna give him a piece of broccoli, but when I look into my plate, I see like slice of pizza, <laughs> you know, with sausage, pepperoni, lots of cheese. I'm like, like no. I don't feed my <laughs> kid this. Yeah, and then I realized um, I have to start um, from myself to change myself, change my everyday eating habits, so I can be an example for my son. Her first step, lots and lots of research. I'm not a professional chef, so I'm self-taught. And um, I go to Google every time <laughs> when I have a question. I took some courses about chocolate, how to make chocolate at home, how to make raw vegan desserts, and vegan desserts, not only raw. Yeah, I use Instagram a lot because I follow bloggers, and recipe creators. I always uh, try stuff at home. I love to feed my family and hear their feedback, good feedback. After three years of running Simply Sweet, being a mom is still Alessia's top priority. And uh, I have a son, he's almost six years old and he likes my dessert. He's a big fan of chocolate. He likes chocolate truffles, chocolate cake. <laughs> so I try to keep him healthy. You must be the most popular mom in town. Like, do you bake everyone's cake? Um, or no bake? I keep saying bake, but really there's no baking involved. I don't know. I would say yeah, maybe I'm pretty famous here. <laughs> I had to learn the secrets behind Alessia's unique treats. So she taught me how to make her favorite item on the menu, lemon blueberry cheesecake. It's super easy and literally everybody can make it at home. You're not dealing with an oven. You're sticking no. in the freezer, you're letting it set. Yeah, it's a lot. It. Yeah, it's like low maintenance as well. Yeah. First, the hazelnuts go in then shredded coconut, and my favorite sugar alternative, dates. I love dates, it's like a part of my life <laughs> and brand. Too, yeah. The mixture is blended in a food processor for two to three minutes. So what should the texture be like, you know, when we know it's done? Yeah, uh, it usually changes the color. Okay. And it's like a little darker. Wet. Yeah. The pie crust is then firmly pressed into a mold. The sticky dates help bind the raw ingredients while the base freezes for about 15 minutes. The crust is in our freezer. Yeah. What are we gonna do next? Uh, so now we are going to make our cheese part. First in, soaked and drained raw cashews. Soaking the cashews makes them easier to blend and ensures a creamy, smooth consistency. Our house-made coconut milk. I love that you make your own coconut milk. So how do you make it? Uh, we just mix coconut butter and filtered water. Coconut butter. Cool. Nothing else. I <laughs> love that. Very minimal. Next up, maple syrup, vanilla extract, lemon juice, and melted coconut oil. Okay, so you've yeah. melted and cooled that? Yeah. Okay. It's already melted and we use coconut oil so it stay firm mm. and when you um, take the cake out of freezer, it doesn't fall apart. The mixture is blended until it's totally smooth with no lumps. Can you believe this creamy filling is completely vegan? Okay, it's perfect. So now we're gonna put it in the freezer for like an hour. Okay. And then we're gonna uh, do our blueberry layer. Amazing. Okay. See you later. To the remaining cashew mixture, we add frozen blueberries and then blend again. With the fruit, the mix transforms into a stunning purple. Love Look it. How beautiful. Very I love creamy. This gorgeous color. It's so pretty. Wait, we have to show them this color. Sure. Check this out, everyone. Look at that. The first layer freezes for an hour before adding the blueberry flavored cream. Alessia was prepared with a fully frozen, half finished cheesecake for me to polish off. Gorgeous. And then to the freezer it goes? Yeah, to the freezer for about five hours. Okay. Then, and then it will be ready. And it'll be worth it. Those yeah. five hours will be worth it. <laughs> All right. Thankfully, I didn't have to wait five hours. So this is how it looks like. Yay, it's so pretty. And we're gonna unmold it. Okay. 
After unmolding, the cheesecake gets a final decoration, shavings of Alessia's house-made chocolate. So how long would you wait for it to thaw before you start slicing it to serve? Uh, we will leave it at room temperature on the table for okay. about 30 to 40 minutes. Okay. And then we can cut it. Well, luckily, you're very prepared. You have slices yeah. for us. So can we taste? Yes, yeah, sure, of course. I'm so excited. Here we go. Look how pretty they are. <laughs> this food is really fun. Wow. It's so delicious. You know, cake is such a comfort food for so many people, and a lot of people don't think they can have this healthier, delicious, decadent options. What are your favorite customer reactions from people who maybe haven't tried this before? Most of them don't realize um, our dessert doesn't have eggs and flour, and they're like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> they can't believe it. This is so fun to make it, and I will be eating this and taking it with me. So okay. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. With innovative techniques and lots of imagination, modern chefs are turning classic meals and treats into plant-based comfort foods everyone can enjoy. Good morning, it's Thursday. Top story, Republicans officially taking control of the House. But a battle for the heart of the GOP is now underway. It's November 17th. This is Today. Of power, the House goes red after Democrats hang on to the Senate. This morning, the impact of a split Congress and the growing fallout over Donald.